I have the huge pleasure to introduce David McIntosh, who is an ENT surgeon from Australia, who's fascinated with the whole airway issue, uh, has been and is very interested in working with dentists and really trying to understand what's happening and the best ways to correct these problems. David, tell me, give me a little brief synopsis of your um, career and present interests. Certainly. So my, I mean, my career is the same as everybody else. And initially, you do the basic ear, nose and throat training and get indoctrinated with the dogma of uh, this is how it is. And then as, as you sort of expand out, I, I was really quite fortuitous uh, and, and I feel quite blessed that I actually uh, was approached by some dentists who had an interest in uh, kids with mouth breathing and snoring and teeth grinding who felt in their mind that the knee, nose and throat doctor needed to be involved. And this was a little bit new and novel for me in, in some respects. But rather than be dismissive of that experience, I, I took that on board and I went and did a little bit of homework and research and I found in actual fact they were absolutely right. And, you know, you dig into the research, you know, well over 100 years ago, uh, it, the, 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 the treatment protocols uh, for, for children with mouth breathing and turning up to an orthodontist uh, was basically send them to the ENT. So this is actually not a new concept. So with those seeds planted, I uh, followed a, a somewhat different pathway to many. And in doing so, I've learned a huge amount more than, than what I gathered from my medical training and my ENT training. And I have a very different perspective now when I look at children in terms of airway problems. And in the process now, um, I think dentists that, are, that I work with have a different you know, viewpoint as to uh, jaw problems and, and we mutually recognize that we need each other to get some outcomes that maybe we couldn't have achieved individually. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, I think we're going to have to be looking oh, as a wider, wider teams to try and help people. Um, I will never forget that during my orthodontic training, I had to spend two weeks in an ENT department and I couldn't get over the fact of how similar the patients we were treating were. So in the entrance to my ortho school, you would have a wide corridor with plastic seats down every side. And this was identical to the entrance in the ENT department where I did my two week placement. And the kids sitting there, as you walked in, waiting, seemed to be identical. I mean, identical yeah. facial forms, yeah. And a lot of them even wearing brackets and row yeah. uh, fixed appliances. So I, it yeah. amazed me. Now, David, I think, I really think there's a, we have a lot of um, cross um, interests in what we're doing. And I think that I need to find, I've been looking for a, <clears throat> someone like you for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so I thought the best way to do maybe to start with a um, presentation so yeah. I put a presentation in explaining, you know, it, it would be good just to have something that was tangible, that Absolutely. kind of would, you know, would, would make sense. So um, I thought that if I made a presentation, stop me at any point. Hopefully we'll have a bit of time afterwards to go through. This is a presentation, the slides of which I've used many times. I mean, I'm not, okay. you know, I need to update my slides, but um, we all do. Um, yeah. So yeah. I'll start here with, oh, hang around, let me just do. Um, yeah, that's fine, Mike. And while you're getting that loaded, I think you know, I'll, I'll reflect on what you said, because when we look at the research, the, the science shows that if we send an ENT surgeon into an orthodontic clinic, they will find airway problems in somewhere between 40 to 80% of those children. Mm. Mm. And if we send an orthodontist into an ENT clinic, they will find orthodontic problems in somewhere, again, between 40 to 80% of those children. So yeah. there is definitely something going on in the water that, that we, we, you know, no, nobody should be ignoring anymore. Um, no, and, no. Yeah. I, yeah. And what, what, one of the things I really like, Dave, is you're well up on your research at the moment. I mean, I have periods. I mean, to be keep up on research, you need to be focused on it all the time. And I have worked so hard on a number of other projects, some of which I didn't really want. Yeah. And I'm somewhat behind on knowing everything at the moment, and I want to get back up to speed fairly soon. So um, 
here we are with crooked teeth and yep. we've been treating crooked teeth now for a hundred and bit years and we seem to have focused on using this system that can make teeth straight. So we say we have a problem that's crooked teeth. The solution is to straighten them. Yep. And, and I had the same treatment myself. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I've, I've worked straightening teeth. But, I, I, you know, seems that people prefer simple answers. However, Absolutely. I'm worried about a lot of things here. Because I worry that, from my viewpoint, we're only looking at a symptom, we're only treating a symptom, and you could have asked that to Frank. You could have asked that to Frankel many years ago, yeah, and these teeth the also don't seem to stay straight. Yes. Now, you, if you, when you actually look at the evidence, it seems that malocclusion is an evolutionary disease. Yep. So it's a classic mismatch between how we evolved to live and how we do live. So it's caused by the environment, but there may be genetic predispositions. So you are, because of your environmental change, you're likely to get malocclusion. However, your genetic makeup may influence what type of malocclusion you get. Yeah, so I, I, I run courses, and, and, and when I, and I, one of the advantages I think I have is that, that I, I self admittedly have no dental training. I'm not a dentist, I'm not an orthodontist, yeah. but I also then have no bias from, from, yeah, from no, 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 that's excellent. Either. Yeah, and, and when, I, when I run my courses talking about things and I, you know, discuss malocclusion, I discuss malocclusion in very much the same way as, as looking at cancer. Cancer is a genetic and an environmental disease. Mm. And there are certain elements of your genetics that will predispose you to getting cancer and will also make you vulnerable to certain environmental factors. And likewise, there are genetics that will protect you against exposure yes. to certain environmental factors. Yeah. So, for example, not everybody that smokes cigarettes gets lung cancer. Yeah, I mean, everyone quotes it's that Clay Cass of, case of someone who smoked heavily for 90 years and is yep. fine. It happens. Yep. They've got, they're, they're, the reality is they had good genetics. Now that's, you know, mm -hmm. you don't want to find that out, you know, by virtue of testing the water, you know, we, we don't advocate, you know, how good are your genetics to have a cigarette and, and, and do it until you, you know, like you said, 90 to prove the point. But, you know, th but I think this is the, the, the reality too, is that when we are looking at the manifestation of malocclusion, uh, people talk about, well, you know, not every mouth breather gets a malocclusion, therefore mouth breathing has got nothing to do with it. That, 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 that argument's like saying, well, not everyone gets cigarette, you know, that smokes cigarettes gets lung yeah, cancer. Yeah, so it's got nothing to do with it. It's, some it's other, a nonsense discussion. Some of that detail I want to go into, because what I'm suggesting here as I go on to, that malocclusion is not a disease, it's a symptom of something. I agree. And it's a symptom of this overall problem that's leading to all of the problems that we see. I agree. Now, um, what I'm interesting in the slide I've got here, it's a slide from Profit, the pie chart. So the pie chart comes from Prophet, and he talks about us understanding malocclusion in about 5% of cases. Now, mm -hmm. if you only understand malocclusion in 5% of cases, then you don't really understand the disease. And when, when you actually look into that, well, that 5% includes it's all of the syndromes, the trauma, yep. the pathology, any a sort of pathology, as well yep. as the thumb suckers. In fact, yep. the largest chunk there will be thumb suckers because if someone's sucking yep. their thumb, they can point to that and they can say, ah, oh, that's the cause. Um, yep. And I, I, I'm not totally happy with that because, um, you know, there were tribes where they enforced thumb sucking and no one got malocclusion. So I mm -hmm. wonder if thumb sucking isn't a, then a, just a precipitating factor. So when you're getting a problem, it will determine how the front teeth look within that matrix of problem. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I have an interesting reflective point on, on the thumb sucking, for example, which other people, you know, that deal with this have reflected on and, and taken on board as well. So one of the observations is that uh, thumb sucking is more prevalent in children that have nasal obstruction and tongue tie. So my, my premise or my theory of, on, on that is that there is something about the tongue touching the hard palate that somehow is a brain signal that the brain needs to know that things are okay. 
And in the process of that being the case, um, if the tongue, if for some reason, is not tucked in the palate, then the thumb acts as a bridge between the, the tongue and the palate, which then leads to the brain being happy. And you can put a child through any sort of thumb-sucking regime to try and mitigate things. But the reality is until that tongue and palate connection is established either by making them able to breathe through their nose or releasing their tongue tie, then you're struggling against the reality of, of nature, basically. Um, you know, I, can I, can I another connection. one little point here, David, because, you know, I talked to my father. He's, he's, he's an incredible environmentalist. He thinks we're all born genetically perfect. And he is saying that tongue tie is because you don't stretch your tongue. That's mm -hmm. why you get a tongue tie. It's because if you don't use this system, it doesn't break down. You don't get the selective apoptosis that yep. breaks things down. And so maybe, I'm just putting a possibility there, that the thumb suckers, it's not the people that are thumb sucking because they've got tongue ties. They've got tongue ties because they're thumb sucking. Yeah. And they're not fully using the range. Yeah. Probably the thing that might may potentially mitigate that being the case is that the tongue ties are there at birth. Um, uh, so yeah, yeah, but I, I thought I'd seen some images of in, individuals sucking their thumb in the womb. Yeah, so I was going to say, so people will then talk to about the, the, the thumb sucking in the womb, but no one's really done those longitudinal studies. No, 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 no one, one knows. No, it's up in the yeah, end. We yeah, can't yeah. make any decision. Okay, yeah. on this slide, I've also got the book of Coraccini because Coraccini, he's done the research and it's crazy how long ago he did that research. I mean, there's lots of people. There's, there's Brace, Lieberman, um, Unger, um, uh, lots of great researchers. I'm trying to think of that other guy's name, but there's lots. And they've, they've really piled this high and deep. Anyway, um, I, I've, I've, draw, I've made this um, graph and it's an approximation from what I think roughly was happening, I go back 220,000 years. However, you could probably go a lot further than that. I think the earliest finds of what they call anatomically correct Homo sapien is now 350,000 years ago. And there's no suggestion that there was any significant level of malocclusion. In fact, there was about 5%. That's about your trauma level, you know, sorry, accidents yep. happen. You know, that's the way it goes. And it seems to start going up. So um, if I have my market, so at about 10,000 years ago, we start to see a little change in how things are. Because remember, people never had an overjet and overbite because they wore their teeth down. So, yep. you know, the idea is if you incise something, if you've got, you know, you're, you're eating a bit of meat, oh, here we go, I've got a plastic locust. So if I've got a bit yeah. like that, I got, that's the only way I can do it. And I've got yeah. to work like this. So then they had this slight anterior open bite because they'd worn their front teeth down and their mandibles would then rotate forward a little bit more. And that was normal. Well, it had been normal yeah. for hundreds of thousands of years. Now, but by about 100,000, 10,000 years ago, we're using a lot of tools and our bite's changing. So now our, ma our mandibular teeth are trapped the lower teeth are trapped with inside the upper teeth, like yep. that. And whereas before, they were worn down and more or less on top, but with a gap. Yep. And then you start from about, if you're, if you're very selective, and it's quite uncommon, you'll start to find a little bit of crowding in the lower front teeth from about 10,000 years ago. It seems yep. to get a lot worse in the last 100 years, though. Yeah. You know, there's a yeah. significant improvement, worsening over the last 100 years. Yeah. But only a thousand years ago, in all of Bugerti Thailander's studies where she's digging up cemetery material, she, they found that every single Scandinavian that had wisdom teeth had them working in function. Only 1,000 yeah. years ago. And there, yeah. were very, there was much less missing wisdom teeth. Yeah. Far, it was far rarer, rarer incidents of missing teeth. Yeah. Then, of course, we've, there's 5,400 planet and each member of each species tends to have perfectly straight teeth from birth mm -hmm. till death which is the our ancestors from birth till death no need for you know low late crowding or anything they had always straight teeth yeah and um, and there are some malocclusion now with domesticated cats and dogs and some feral foxes but i guess that's what you'd kind of expect 
Yeah. And of course, well, dog, dogs is a tricky one to use because basically dog, dogs are, are, are wolves that, that man has bred over time to. Yeah, know, we've massively in, we've inbred them, outbred them and done yeah. kind of crazy stuff. Although when you look yeah. at the work of Chung in Hawaii, because Hawaii is a good place. It had, um, well, you've got, you've got the Polyponesians, then you've got the, yeah. the original set, well, settlers, they settled there from, I don't know where they came from myself. You've got the um, Anglo-Saxons and you've got a lot of Chinese. So you had these three big yeah. population bases. And Chung took well, something like a, a thousand, two thousand people. So a big chunk, a nice chunky piece of research. You know, I don't like these bits of research done with 30 people in orthodontics. It always... Oh, and there's so much of that too. I mean, in 30 people tells you nothing. Sorry. I mean, it, it's, it, it's crazy. That's a, that's Get a, up. That's a classroom of kids. Yeah, 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 yeah. Get up to 500 people, and then that's a nice piece of work. I agree. Anyway, Chung basically looked at whether malocclusion was additive or whether it was just a, a base level layer. And so what he looked at these various different racial groups within um, Hawaii, and he said that it wasn't additive. You know, every, you know, 20 or 30 or whatever percentage of the population got malocclusion. It was the same for all groups. And depending yep. which ethnic group you came from may influence what type of malocclusion, but didn't increase your chances of getting malocclusion. So that old story yep. of um, mummy's little jaws with daddy's big teeth, or your jaws are just too small for your teeth, genetically, it's out the window. Yeah. And of course, you can run the same thing with dogs because you could crossbreed a Chihuahua with a Great Dane. Now, interestingly, the, the, the offspring will be of varying sizes between the Chihuahua and the Great Dane, but none of them, as long as they're fair, reasonably wild, um, will have malocclusion. And the, the single canine tooth from the Great Dane weighs more than the entire head and probably the front half of the Chihuahua. Yep. So um, it's, it's fascinating that we, don't, we seem to have forgotten that basic logic. Now, yeah. on, the, on the slide here, the third group I talk about is the indigenous populations alive today. Yes. Now, as I mentioned earlier on, you only need a bit of flint and you've dramatically changed your environment. And yep. there's almost no indigenous populations today, alive today, that don't have knives. You no. know, a nice metal knife. And as soon as you have yeah. a metal knife, you've reduced the amount of work on incising by a huge yeah. amount. And well, it was I think the other thing, sorry yeah. to interrupt Mike. So I think the other thing that actually, if you look at it historically, that changed was the advent of the use of fire. Because the well, use this, of fire yeah, allowed yeah. The, the change of the consistency of the meat as yeah. well. Which yeah, is obviously that the, must you know, have. The, yeah. yeah. When, when, do, when do people think that happened? Well, it's hard to know. I mean, the sort of suggestion is somewhere between thirty to 50,000 years ago that the use of Ooh. fire was you know, yeah, I'm, somehow I'm, implicated. Yeah, I've, I've heard some estimates of much, much longer than that. Yeah, the, the, the problem is that we, we're, we're, we're guessing. We're guessing, and it depends. Some people are arguing whether that was an accidental fire. You know, if, if there was lightning, you could capture the fire yeah. and move the fire Absolutely. around with you, or whether yeah. you actually had the capacity to make fire. <clears throat> yeah. Now, um, but if you, when you see indigenous populations, one of the most common things I see is they have very little malocclusion. I agree. You know, so it happens. It happens, but there tends to be very little. And I, I yeah. give two slides here, and this was a. Um, this is from War, who was like um, Western Price, traveling around, taking images of people. But this is a, um, uh, a um, Canadian Inuit. And what was fascinating mm -hmm. with the Canadian Inuits was that at, at some point, the um, Canadian government said, you are now um, citizens. You know, yeah. It was wonderful yeah. for them. And they signed beginning turn of the sort of 1900s. Yep. And then, of course, these guys were eligible for food stamps and social housing and social welfare in general. And okay. many of the tribes, it was, it was a mix. Some tribes stayed with their, in their same um, traditional lifestyle, where some tribes yep. moved en masse. You know, the chief would make the decision and they would tell the government and the government would build them some homes. And then they yep. would move en masse into these yep. homes. 
And here you have basically a purebred group of people who have had a dramatic shift in lifestyle. Yep. And within two generations, they all yep. gained the same type of malocclusion that you see in, yep. in, in the same indigenous population surrounding them. Yep. And this sometimes happened within one generation. Yep. And that, you know, really fascinates me. Yeah. And um, the, the other thing that's, that might be worth sharing with you, there's, there's a, a longitudinal study called the Framingham study, which I learned okay. about at university. And that's about cardiovascular disease. And what they did is they studied after World War II, there was a migration of Japanese to Hawaii and they, they monitored the rate of cardiovascular disease. And it was very, very low in Japan. And, and yeah, in yeah. the Japanese that, that then moved again by the second and third generation, they had the background population of cardiovascular disease as everyone else did um, yep. prior. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this is this sort of environmental this is, disease. Yeah, this is this where well, they call it evolutionary medicine, although, of course, I don't, it's, we're not evolving, so sometimes, no. but it's a classic mismatch, classic mismatch, mm. a classic case of evolutionary medicine. Now, yeah. I put two lines here. I've got two lines. Now, what's interesting with this yellow line, that was the Industrial Revolution. Yes. So that was a time when we went from, we went from, I think, what, 19, 80, 90% of the population being subsistent farmers. Yep. Everyone becoming specialized. I think now we have in Britain, we have something like 3% of the population grows all the food in the UK. So yep. there's been a huge change. And the, where it really started to change was in, during the Industrial Revolution. And yep. that went from the point where we, the, the most people made everything they ate. And then we moved yep. across to people buying what they ate. To their food. Yep. Now, I remember being a student making some pretty lousy food and I ate it because it was late and I didn't want to pay for more food and I didn't want to go out. Now, yep. I would never have paid for that type of poo in a restaurant. Um, no. And so once you become a purchaser of something, you become discerning. Yes. Um, I think there was also a change in the amount of pollution and possibly nasal allergies at the same time, but that's, yeah, it, exactly. it was a clear cut you know, there was a big change in lifestyle going down there. Yeah. And then the black line, that is when the orthodontic community took their normative data. Mm -hmm. So when yeah. we're looking at x-rays, when we do keflometric x-rays, we use some normative standards to try and understand what's going on. Yep, and the and, other problem is that you tend to use Caucasian data when we know that it's different between people of back, different racial backgrounds. Although I remember talking to Dave Singh, if you're familiar with the DNA appliance that was, I remember yep. him saying that he did some research um, and they showed that there was the biggest variation was um, your age. Yep. The second biggest variation was your sex. Yep. And the variation in racial groups was less of a variation than the other two. It was the smallest variation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But the age yeah. is huge. I mean, you imagine when a baby's born, this area is tiny, this area is huge. Absolutely. And that progressively changes over time. And yet we're taking kids that aren't fully grown and we're trying to use keflometric data, you know, this normative data, um, for, from adults. And yep. that it just it just doesn't seem yeah it doesn't make any sense. Um, of course, and of course, everyone would get their wisdom teeth in back then. Yeah, as we would discuss, yep. it was normal. You go and see ancestral material. Everyone's got their wisdom teeth in always. Yep. Yep. Now, one thing we don't talk about much in um, orthodontics, or I imagine in ENT either, is where this stuff started. You know, mm. if, if we're treating these, you know, um, within orthodontics, it, it, we have made the assumption that things are genetic. Now, mm. this, is sick, this image here is of the spread of the, um, I guess, is the population group of sickle cell anemia. And yep. basically, if you are not directly related to someone from one of these areas, these hotspot areas, then you won't have sickle cell anemia. And that's it. Yeah. And yep. this is probably, this shows the, um, 
the percentage of the population. So this is showing you where the hotspots, where it probably came from. I mean, tribes may have moved around. We don't know that. Yeah, but sure. this is a smoking gun. Yeah. Whereas when, when you look, and you know, I mean, Western Price, he wasn't very scientific, but he did do some interesting research on this. Um, yeah. And, you know, he noticed how the change was going on. But when you look at the real thing is the anthropological and archaeological material, because they are convinced, well, they, they know malocclusion is a disease of modern civilization. Yeah. You know, and they say wherever, whenever civilization rises up, you see malocclusion. And it's, for them, they'll find a burial site. And the more complex a trinketry and the society's level, the more malocclusion you see. Yep. You also see this occurring in complete isolation. So you'll get yep. one area like classically Central America, their civilization suddenly rises up in complete isolation to anywhere that is accessible at the time. Yep. It happens to happen whatever group, doesn't matter if it was like in South America or it was in China or it was in ancient Rome, all of a sudden the malocclusion appears. It seems proportionate to the level of society. And, you know, I think the an anthropologist and archaeologists, they're convinced. And for them, Corotini, who I mentioned earlier on, he's an anthropologist. Yeah. And, you know, is it crazy that no one's even taken any of his work seriously? Yeah. Now, and what, what, what's interesting, when you reflect on that too, is, is that from an evolutionary point of view, um, sickle cell anemia actually serves a purpose because it's protective against malaria. Yes. Yeah, so it makes sense that sickle cell anemia hangs around to this day. Mm. Malocclusions, mm. on the other hand, to my mind, have no evolutionary advantage whatsoever. No, no. why so, would we suddenly get it? So, so it doesn't make sense that, as no. you say, that it's developing and persisting and, and, and growing. So, you know, it doesn't make sense to call it a genetic disease. I was talking, I was, as you saw, I was on that interview with Brett Weinstein the other day. Yeah, um, of course. And yeah. It was interesting, we, we were discussing wisdom teeth because when I talked to my dental friends about wisdom teeth, I said, so what, why don't we have space for our wisdom teeth or you know, what's going on? You all say, oh, we've evolved out of this. Yeah. I was told, I go, do you, do you, do you, do you so what, understand? So no, no, do you understand the evolution? Because yeah. the, you remember, survival of the fittest is death exactly. of the weakest. You know, there's no other side. It's brutal. That's yeah. how things work. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you want to reduce the number of people in a population that get their wisdom teeth, then you have to go around and either execute or sterilize everyone whose wisdom teeth comes in properly. Yeah. That's the only way to do it. There's, there's, yeah. no, there's no other way to do it. And you have to do that to a lot of people. Yeah, you've got to, If most people have their wisdom teeth coming in, as our ancestors did, that means you're talking about, well, I mean, you, you've got to be up in the sort of 70 or 80 percent of a population extermination to achieve something like that. And I, I wasn't aware anyone had done that. So now, <clears throat> so the next slide here, We're, I'm now thinking about what sort of things are influencing facial form. Yeah. So the gross form of facial form, what's influencing it? Yeah. Well, these two individuals both had muscular dystrophy. Yep. The boy on the left, that's from Prophet's book. And the girl on the right has a Bolton norm over her face. So the mm -hmm. Bolton norm has been superimposed to demonstrate roughly where someone's facial form would have grown. And remember, yep. those norms represent norms taken in the middle of the last century. So they're probably not truly representative of the full extent of what's occurring. Yes. Now, with muscular dystrophy, it is a disease that affects you from quite a young age. However, yes. it's not a disease of the bones. No. It's no. a disease of as, muscle as, as, as and as transmission. Name, as name first. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's just it's, it's yes. something with the nerve plates or something, isn't it? If you remind me of my... Uh, yeah, I'd have to look up because there's different yeah, parts yeah, of yeah, 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 and, okay, and right. those sorts of things. And, and, and so, you know, ear, nose and throat, Mike. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now, what interests me about this girl here where we've got the x-ray is that the position of her 
uh, the chin point. So if I draw, um, if I make a mark here, the difference in the, the, um, the template chin yeah. point and her actual chin point must be about what, five centimeters. Yeah, it's, it's, it's substantial. I it's mean, substantial. It's, it, it's, it's, you know, it, it, it's big. Yeah. Now, I mean, that's probably beyond what you could even achieve with surgery. Yeah. Now, I would, I would estimate that if you were to disarticulate her skull, pull all of those bones apart, put them on the table, compare them with an ideal, or one of those, someone who from that represented that norm, I think you'd find that the, the weight of each bone would be approximately the same. Yep. I think the overall shape and size would be relatively similar. For example, I don't think that mandible is much shorter. Mm -hmm. I, it probably is a little bit shorter or longer, whichever way. It's definitely yeah. a slightly different shape. Yeah. But what I think is a greater change is the relationship between from one bone to the next bone. Yeah. Oh, look, it stands out plain as day when you present it this yeah. way. And so, and if you think, if you make a path from a, mac, a tooth in the upper jaw and you want to get to a tooth in the lower jaw via jumping from different bones, I think you've got a passenger of something four, is it minimum? Anyway, you, you've got a passage of a lot of bones. You, you, you could take, you could go around the back of the skull if you wanted to get there. But there's quite a few bones between the upper jaw and the lower jaw. And they yeah. all have a range of adaptability. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So we, we know that muscle usage probably has an influence. And yeah. of course, we know well, that our ants... You, sorry to interrupt. I can give you an ENT example where that's absolutely the case, Mike. So um, we have a muscle that sort of runs through our neck. It's called the sternomastoid muscle. It goes from the sternum, it goes to the mastoid. So if you follow that muscle up behind your ear is what's called the mastoid process. That is something that you are not born with. That is something that starts to develop as soon as you start to lift your head up and turn your head around. So at about six months of age, it actually starts to develop. So it's muscular pull that is shaping the bone. So that's, yeah. that's, that's one example. Another example is a medical condition called craniosynostosis. And that's where parts of the sutures of the skull prematurely form uh, uh, an attachment to each other. So they fuse earlier than they should. And then that distorts the growth and development of the rest of the skull as a consequence. Mm. And with, with, with a global is, effect. Yeah, absolutely. A massive effect. Yeah, uh, but the global, the so example, it's, it's happening all yeah. over the skull in multiple places. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It changes every bone of the skull. And then the third, the third perfect example is in those that are chronic teeth grinders, we will see the development of what's called tori uh, for your audience, which is the bony development on the hard palate. So yeah. it's a lump on the hard palate. Uh, uh, and that comes from teeth grinding. The, 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 mm. the, 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 basically, I, I use the example of it's like seismic plates and they come together and when they push together hard enough, you form a mountain. Well, yeah, good, that's, good that's example. What it, that, that's what it's doing. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not quite as certain why we get a mandibular tori, but it has been observed no, that mandibular tori are just on the inside from where we have the foramen. Yeah, I agree. So, I think Maybe, we the mandibular tori, but the maxillary ones, I think we've yeah, got some yeah. good evidence. So we're talking mandibular is the mandible, lower jaw, maxillary, upper jaw. Yeah. Now, what's interesting when you look at the, um, the effect, the wear on teeth. So it was apparently, it was not uncommon for someone in the middle of the, um, and so if you, the end of the medi up till the end of the medieval period, it was not uncommon for someone to wear their teeth down so far that their roots would break, uh, their teeth would break into separate roots by the middle yep. of the fourth decade. So when they were in yep. their middle forties, now I admit that's relatively old for that era. I was going to say, teeth, that's actually quite, quite advanced age. Yeah, yeah. Although, remember, they would, they would often find some very old people. So yeah. you would often find yeah. something like 80 or 90 years old going back time memorial, which is yeah. crazy because these people would have been alive for what? How many generations of other people? Yeah, anyway, absolutely. you know, like I, I remember working in hospital with some 90 year old gentleman walks in and I go, right, what's your previous medical history? Nothing. 
never, yep. ever seen a doctor in my entire life. Yep. And you go, wow. And these yeah. they survive. They survive. No, never seen. If you've got clean water and you've got good food, the human body can do it. And if you're not overly yeah. stressed. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. you've got... Um, so if, if the tooth's going to wear all the way down to the root, that's a lot of wear. I mean, I'm estimating our ancestors were doing something like 20 plus times the amount of effort that we do. Yep. And that is a lot more effort. And yep. of course, what we've done, we've moved from this incredibly tough, rough, hard diet over this, well, mm, if you're into smoothies, you can get away without yep. using any masticatory effort at all. Absolutely. You know, I, I could, if I really filled this cup, I could probably get, you know, uh, three, four spoons of sugar, maybe some marshmallows, yeah, you, you, some milk. Yeah, you, could, you could get easily get an, as an adequate energy supply. Yeah, yeah. So maybe a th a 500 calories, a third of my daily yeah. required intake in one cup, yeah. no masticatory yeah. effort at all. Now, if you yeah. go back a thousand years, how much effort did you, well, let's say 10,000, even a thousand, thousand years ago, there was yeah. no sugar. Yeah. How much well, even, effort? even for, the, for the sugar, you had to chew on the sugar cane. Yeah, yeah, if you, you could get your sugar, hands you, actually, you had to actually chew on it. I don't know if you've ever yeah. done it, but it's, it's actually... No, I've, I've done some. Um, it's, it's, it's okay. Yeah. It's less so you had than to, you might so, imagine. So you had to earn it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. You had to earn your calories. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and these are just, you know, giving some examples of the amount of wear people would do. And I think yeah. we've gone, as I said, I think we're doing something in the region of 3 to 5% the masticatory effort of our ancestors, which is yeah. crazy. Now, yeah. this is a picture that I see all over the internet. I see in all this kinds is a of famous, people's this is a, these, are, these are famous photos, yes. So this was the um, son of a statistician that was helping my father. Mm -hmm. And he got an obstruction to a gerbil that he kept in his bedroom. And yep. he gained nasal obstruction. And it, it's, you know, it would appear that this had a, an effect on him. You, you don't yep. know. Maybe something else happened at the same time. Of course. Of course. But it is interesting that you have this dramatic change. And, of course, this then always reminds me of Harvold, who's done some great research. In this. Of course, I was going to say, well, this, is, this is Harvold all over again. Yeah, Linda Aronson as well. I liked his research. But let's, let's go to yeah. Harvold, because people always quote this paper where they block the noses of the monkeys. Yep. And Actually, the problem I is, it this morning on Facebook. <laughs> wonderful. And you've got these the three outcomes that happened. One group yep. literally woke up, decided, I'm not having this, and died. Yep. Weren't many of them, but it was interesting. They chose death over not being able to breathe out their nose. Then some of them breathed like this. Yep. And they didn't get such bad malocclusions, a tendency towards a deep bite. And then some of them yep. did this. And they yep. were quite badly affected. Yep. And the, the, the inference, you know, the rumor is that the different family groups went in different manners. I, I don't know. I mean, it's not been proven. However, he, even before this, he did a much better bit of research that seemed, seemed that no one ever quotes. And this is, and he really did this properly. He had 18 controls, 18 um, experimental monkeys. The experimental monkeys were six um, growing males, six growing females, and six non-growing females, <clears throat> all age-matched and sex-matched. And he then just got an angled, rather sharp piece of plastic and he sutured it in the roof of their mouth. All right. No more. That's all he did. Now, initially, the tongues ulcerated. Yep. And then they hung their mouths open. Yep. And he got clear, 100% skeletal malocclusion, gross wow. skeletal and dental malocclusion in the experimental lung monkeys, and he got none in the um, non-experimental monkeys. Earlier on, yeah, sorry, couldn't talk about it. Earlier on, I mentioned about how uh, the other 5,400 species don't have any problems. It's amazing, um, amazing just how perfectly their teeth fit together. And when you look at the control monkeys, their teeth fit together just sweet, absolutely perfectly. Yep. Whereas the, the experimental monkeys had these gross changes. And Harvold was reputed to say, tell me what malocclusion you want, and I will tell you how to get it. Wow. Um, 
So, um, I mean, he, 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 my father and Harville got on like a house on fire. They really did. They were, um, mm. they were, they were good, good friends. Yeah. Anyway, now, so what I'm suggesting is that <clears throat> for the general structure of the face, we've gone from this incredibly tough, rough, hard diet where we always used to breathe through our noses and had good right. body posture. So this really soft diet where we'll, we'll get a nasal obstruction. And people get nasal... I mean, do you think many kids make it one year without getting a nasal obstruction? Well, I think, every, you know, really, the reality is just by virtue of having a cold or a flu, you're going to have a temporary obstruction. Yeah. You know, that's, that, that's the, I, think, I, I don't think we should pretend that that's, that's not a reality. Yeah. Um, what Often. we don't know is is we don't know what is the dose response effect. Like how long yeah, does the yeah. nose need to be blocked for? And a change and again, in it habits. Comes down to, it can, yeah, exactly. And how, you know, it, it comes down to people's susceptibility too. So, mm -hmm. you know, this is, this is the conundrum we have against, you know, the, that, that genetic and environment thing is because, again, you can have your mouth breather that's got great genetics um, and is resilient to the changes that one would expect. Or, or maybe but, has yeah, a harder food. Uh, yeah, all, exactly. And all those other variables that come into it that could mitigate against the changes that you would hypothesize should be pretty, you know, consistent. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, so, but you're absolutely right, is, is that we have this situation now where we've got, you know, I, I know from my own ENT practice is that if I look at what I was doing 15 years ago surgically to get kids breathing better, my intervention rate for nasal obstruction so i'm not talking about adenoids adenoids are behind the nose i'm talking within the nose itself my intervention rate has skyrocketed and also the need for more aggressive types of surgery has escalated as well so not only am i doing more of it but the type of surgery that i need to do is far more aggressive yeah. to re-establish nasal patency in, so you know, these we, are children so you're that, suggesting a deterioration in symptoms well, I'm, I'm just sharing an observation. You know, I, I, I know yeah. what my clinic and my protocols were uh, 15 years ago. I know what they were and I know what they are now. Yeah. And I know yeah. that it was very unusual that I would have to resort to, in inverted commas, more aggressive surgery in children under the age of eight. Now I'm doing the same thing in children at the age of four. That's, that's over 15 years that where that has changed. Yeah, well, we'll come to that. I've got a slide where we can discuss that later on because that interests yeah. me greatly. Because you know. Anyway, so we've got this, the two things that we've got reduction in the masticatory force and then these nasal obstructions are causing people to first breathe out their mouth while their noses are blocked. Yep. But to breathe out your mouth, you've got to lower your tongue off the roof of the mouth, separate Great. the teeth and separate yep. the lips. Now, yep. when, you, when your nose becomes patterned again, you may or may not return to the same posture. Correct. And that's my concern. I think that yeah. people are, what starts of, of obligation becomes a habit. And I see yep. all these kids like this. Yep. Uh, yep. Yeah, so there's a way, a classroom. Uh, Yep. So, um, okay, so I've got a diagram here done by father. And of course, if you've got your tongue up on the roof of the mouth, so that's your direct yep. forces. If you've got your teeth biting together hard, your indirect forces, because it's via the periodontal membrane, yep. then your growth's going to grow. It's going to be under tight control. That's the way growth will grow. And that will look very similar to our ancestral norms. Rather yep. than our modern norms, it would look similar to our ancestral norms. And yep. of course, you can see all of the space down the back here for your tongue, wisdom teeth, airway, swollen adenoids and tonsils. You can get them all in there. doesn't matter. Yep. Yep. It now, accommodates them. It accommodates whatever happens. Now, then if you're hanging your mouth open, you've got weak muscles, your face is going to go down. Correct. And that's a different... And I think it's important just to highlight you because you're absolutely right. We've looked at the muscle strength in mouth breathers and the muscle strength decreases. Yeah. One of the problems with muscle strength um, intra-variation. So when you look at Kiliardis' research, he found that people with square faces had tougher muscles. 
and he had the averages were nice and clear, like, you know, a difference like this. Mm. But when you look yeah. to the intra and intra differences, you had a great big overlap like that. So it yeah. was, it was difficult to pinpoint one person. And that's, I think, because in my mind, the overall etiology of facial growth direction is this dual, dual thing between um, muscle effect. I haven't decided whether it's muscle, the time the muscle the, you're biting together, the hardness you're biting together. So I'm just calling it muscle effect. And then you've got the posture effect. And we'll, we'll narrow those down as we do research and we do a little bit of, of um, thinking in future. Now, one of the things is that you notice how this, as this face drops down, you have to remodel the mandible I don't think it really dramatically changes length. I don't think that's very important, to be honest. But the mandible has to remodel because there's only a certain pathway into the head. There's lots of other vital structures, so it has to be remodeled so that at least for this first couple of centimeter, it's running in the same track um, that it used to run in before mm -hmm. it downswung. And it, interesting, that looks identical to that girl we looked at earlier on with the um, uh, with the muscular dystrophy. Muscular dystrophy, yeah, yeah. Um, so, in in effect, I say what it tends to be. It's this is this is an ancestral. I think this is actually a an, this is an ancient skull over the top of a Bolton norm. Mm -hmm. Now, the Bolton norms were considered good growing skulls. So that's why it's yeah. so dramatic, because you can see the ancient skull. You've got this tip to tip ratio with the teeth worn down a little bit. And of course, in time, yeah. if they didn't have any tools, they'd have created an antelope bite. And you can see the incisors on the um, Bolton skull are set back and down. So they've got yep. what we refer to as it's down swung. So it's gone down yep. and back. We've got lots of words for this. We talk about horizontal or vertical growing. That's <clears throat> a common term. The one that Bjork used was anterior or posterior rotators. And they're all looking at slightly different things and they've got baggage. So we're trying to use the term an upswing or a downswing in facial form. Yeah. Now, what really interests me here is that you can see how those incisors have dropped down and back. And that is quite a lot but nothing compared to how much the molars have moved back. Yeah. And the reason behind this is, of course, it's a three-dimensional uh, structure. And, of course, exactly. what's happening, it's, they, they, they all have these great big broad arches, and these arches are narrowing down. Yep. So as you're going back, you can see my wrists travel a further, greater distance yeah. than my yeah, fingers are traveling. There's, there's a compression torque. Yeah. And so that just gives you another estimation of how much tongue space we've lost. Because yeah. when we look in mouths and people say, oh, I can see you've got a narrow arch, I'm thinking, well, yes, but you've also got an arch that's less long and is yep. set back further yep. down towards yep. your airway. Yep, exactly. You know, the tongue extends down to the hyoid bone. So the more the yep. face drops down towards the hyoid bone, and of course the airway, the bigger problem you're going to have. Exactly. Now, in a way, this is a little bit like if you'd had a stroke. Yeah, it is. So, you know, you, you, you've got, you, you, it's a bit like, as I said, you, I, 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 you liked my comment I made the other day that it's a bit like someone's got a waxwork model. That's your face was made of wax. You get a little bit yeah. too close to the fire and it whoo, just melts down. Yeah. So I did a, uh, did a lecture. Yeah. I did a lecture called Modern Melting Faces, and that's basically what I'm wow. saying, the effect of melting down. Yep, yep. Now, the, what's interesting about these strokes, these are people who have had a stroke in their facial muscles. So for anyone who wants to know, well, that's the muscle that I think it's, it's five, isn't it, facial muscle? Uh, it's facial seven? nerve seven. is seven. Seven, so seven. Yeah. seven. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, masticatory muscles are five. That's, and yeah, the yeah, muscles yeah, yeah. Are there. that's a try. So that's the muscle that controls just your facial expression. So this is not the muscles that we're really worried about here. No. I have seen, I remember being in um, a hospital when I was working in hospitals and seeing someone who had severed their trigeminal nerve, no, nerve mm -hmm. number five, the muscle here, and his face had fallen so badly 
so yep. quickly and so dramatically. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, you know, it really amazed me to see how much that yeah. had happened. Um, yeah. So, and I just don't have any photographs of that. But what is interesting to me is that the same, it, it seems to me you can get a change like this when you're 80 years old. Yeah. So that's fascinating because we talk about orthodontics being for people when they're young and growth of man manipulation when you're young. But it's clear yeah. that when it goes wrong, you can change things at any age. And when I, when I mentioned Harvold's research earlier on, he was noticing the maxilla was dropping at 1.5 millimeters a month yep. in these monkeys. Yeah. 1.4, yep. sorry. And okay. he was saying that was exactly the same rate as the growing males, growing females, and the non-growing females. For the growing yep. females to have exactly the same rate of maxillary <laughs> downswing, that fascinated yeah. me because yeah. clearly I find it easier to treat people under 10. Is of that course. because of their bones or is that become, they've already become old dogs with their muscle habits? Or is it both? Uh -huh. Yeah, it could be. <laughs> Most likely it probably is a bit both. But of course, if you're going to downswing, so your face is going, you've only got so much face. Yep. If it's going to get longer, it's going to get narrower and shallower. Uh, that, exactly. That's the reason. And of course, specifically, exactly. you're down swinging with a tongue moving down towards the airway. Yep. Now, um, which one of these two do you think is the down swing? Who's growing vertically? Yeah. Well, you see, know. For, for, people, for people that may not be familiar with what we're looking at here, so yes, what we're demonstrating you. here, Mike, is a, is a scan um, that's basically cut through uh, the level of the tongue and the throat. And there's a, there's a line that's superimposed there just towards the center of each picture. And, and what you've done there is you've outlined the airway space in these individuals. And the, the, oh, yeah. the simple you know, observation, once that's explained, is that there's a, a marked difference between the airway space available from the left versus the right. Yeah. So for, for the person on the right to have the same you know, normal degree of breathing, uh, there's going to have to be a hell of a lot more effort to basically be normal. Mm. And the pr problem, of course, is when you're asleep, that's not when that's, that's not what happens. So, well, yeah, when, you're thing is when you're asleep. Now, this is interesting, David, because I've, I've thought about this one. And mm. it's almost as if the tongue, um, I don't have an image of it. If you imagine the tongue like a long snake. Mm-hmm. Now, we've had to, as craniofacial dystrophy, as I term this change, has affected us. It's almost as if we've had to compensate. And it's almost as if the tongue, the bits of the tongue are now in slightly different places. Yep. yep. And the whole structure has changed. You know, the architecture has changed. And because the architecture has changed, we are now having certain functions occurring at slightly different places. And yeah. because certain functions are happening in different places, to maintain an open airway, particularly when you're at a disadvantage, you are having to recruit muscles that would normally be um, conscious. Passive. Yeah. Conscious, conscious muscles. So, yeah. you know, in turn, yeah. it's ectoderm on the inside coming from the inner bit, you know, your heart, lungs, yeah. tissue. I don't worry about how they get on. They, all, they run themselves. We have right. endoderm on the outside, which is all these bits of things I use and work. Yep. And of course, that line is basically on halfway through, well, two thirds of the way through the tongue. Two thirds of the yep. way through the tongue, it transits from ectodermal to endodermal tissue. And yep. that's the point. So that's a very sensitive point. And so if we are having to recruit now conscious voluntary muscles, that's going to disturb our sleep pattern. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Look, uh, you, you, you demonstrated something there, which I'd, I'd just like to share with everyone. So one of the things you did, I don't know if you're conscious of it, but you did a forward head posture uh, just to sort of demonstrate what people are observing. Hmm. And, and I have a very good, simple explanation for that, but it requires some background knowledge in, in knowing basically how we do mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. So yeah, in yeah. individuals other than, is it, other than in infants, what the first thing you do before you commence mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation or, or what you call CPR, uh, is that you tip the head back. And the reason that we do that is that that movement opens up the airway. 
Mm. So if I just turn to the side for a moment, so and I'll exaggerate this. So if I have some form of airway obstruction, I work out that doing that absolutely helps me breathe better. But this is not a functional position for walking. So I then transition to doing that. So that's where you can get this forward head posture as a compensatory mechanism for an airway problem. Mm. So that then um, is an issue because people will find these forward head postures and go, no, put your head back without necessarily realizing that although a forward head posture is not a good position to be in, it may be a survival mechanism that yeah, is yeah. Um, important to that individual. Well, you've got two options here, good posture or breathing. Yeah, breathing wins. Breathing wins. And it's interesting since um, I've been thinking more in regard with, which is represented by this slide. I used to think to people, I used to say to people, when the tongue drops back and down, what is compressible in this area? And yeah. I used to be thinking, well, it's going to be the airway, isn't it? Mm. I'm also now thinking of the carotid sheath, all the things that are in the carotid sheath. Yep. Yeah. I mean, there's, yeah. Professor Zamb Zamb Zambezi, Zambozi, and he was treating MS using stents in the jugular at about this point. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? And then I see all these people with acne just on their face. Yeah. Just on their face. And of yep. course, you've got the drain from the lymph system going down the carotid sheath. Yeah. And yeah. People it's an interesting observation. Yeah, yeah, I've done a lecture on that. Yeah, it's fascinating. I, mean, I think, you know, there's yeah. so many vital things here that if yeah. you get a great change in structure, you're likely to get problems. Yeah. The other thing I'd like to share, just, just because we're looking at that airway picture, is, is that the airway, um, you know, in cross-section actually has two dimensions. It has an anteroposterior, which is tongue and posterior pharyngeal wall, but it has a left and right. And, and what I see as an ENT, um, when I'm putting my telescopes down noses and assessing people with obstructive sleep apnea, uh, when they're in the upright position and they've got full muscle you know, control and tone because they're awake, when I perform a certain breathing manoeuvre, the point of collapse is actually predominantly from side to side, not, f not basically tongue to the back. So their lateral pharyngeal wall uh, tone is actually lost and, and this has been researched and what's been found is people with a nasal obstruction for whatever cause for reasons that we don't understand the muscle tone in their lower throat decreases so you have an initial nasal obstruction that then leads to a, a collapsibility of the lower airway that is far more than what it should be so they actually end up with two levels of airway problems um, simply for starting from the nose. And there's been some research that's come out in the past month where they've looked at females who generally speaking, and again, for reasons that we don't fully understand, females seem to be generally protected from airway problems compared to males. We look at, at paediatric and, and adult populations uh, and so forth. Uh, males are, are far more vulnerable. What they did in the female population is they got a group of females who basically had the obstructive sleep apnea and they got they, they matched females in terms of body habitus and shape as best they could. And the thing that they found is that those females with the nasal obstruction, that was the tipping point to getting the sleep apnea or not. So, so again, just, just going back to what you said, there's a substantial value to breathing through your nose, not only for breathing through the nose, but potentially for maintaining the tone within the lower part of the throat as well. So, but then if you, I guess there's a greater tendency for people who are breathing through their nose to keep their mouth closed. Uh, well, you, you don't have to. Nose, you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. you so don't have to. Because I see, I see some people, remember, who are walking around like this, breathing through their nose. Correct. And that Great. was where um, I think that's what unstuck Linda Aronson's work and Woodside, who uh, talked well, about you, some other time. The, 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 speaking again as, as, as the ENT in the room, the, one, of the, the, one of the issues that people don't realise when they look at Linda Aronson's work is that, that and, and for people that are not familiar with this, so, so Linda Aronson did some research looking at basically jaw and development and in the context then of having um, ENT surgery. And in particular, mm. you know, having the adenoids removed. 
and then looking at the skeletal changes that came about and, and so forth that was related to that. There's a couple of deficiencies. I mean, it's great research, but it needs to be done in the contemporary era, again, looking at things better as we understand things better. Because first of all, back then, the adenoidectomy technique um, we know was deficient in removing the adenoids in a substantial number of people. Um, that, that particular technique uh, doesn't get the adenoids out adequately, probably as in high as 25% of people. Uh, can I yeah, make a so point that, on that, though? Remember, yeah, yeah. The, I don't think that would have affected his research because he simply, I, I talked to him about this. It was a, it's a lovely chat. Yeah. Yeah. So what he simply did was once they took the, I think it was adenoids out, wasn't it? It was. It was Once they out. took the adenoids out, they simply separated them into two groups. One group yep. could physically breathe if they wanted to through their nose, yep. and one of yep. them still couldn't. Yep. So if you had an inefficient or a more efficient adenoid um, surgery, you would simply change the relative sizes of the two groups. I don't but, think you but, would have affected but, the overall design of the study. Yeah. P potentially, but if you had a partial removal of the adenoids, but that would be perceived as an improvement, then that muddies the waters. And, and this is where it's interesting. When mm. we look at malocclusion and adenoid size, and this is where it's contrary to ENT teaching, because ENT teaching is basically if the adenoids are occupying the back of the nose, sort of, you know, 50, 60% or more, then, you know, and they're symptomatic, get them out. There's, there's some research that shows a dose um, response curve in terms of malocclusion adenoid size. And as soon as you hit 40%, that's when the malocclusion start to go up. So when you have a, but when you have a 40% adenoid size, you can breathe okay, in theory. So there's something not quite right about, you know, our understanding of how this all matches up versus the ENT, the mouth breathing and the adenoid size, and then the subsequent malocclusions. Because of 40% yeah. occupation of the adenoids in, in the, the post-nasal space, in, in ENT teaching is not a problem. But from an orthodontic point of view, it yeah. seems to be. So potentially with the Linda Aronson group, is there's those that couldn't breathe, yeah, they were still blocked. Those that could breathe better, as judged by the ENTs, would be considered adequate, but potentially in light of what we now know, potentially because of the inadequacies of the surgery, still could have been inadequate. Yeah. And then, of course, the other issues are then, you know, what else was going inside the nose? Was there a deviated septum and was there, you know, turbinate problems? And the other thing that I would highlight, because I see this particularly in adults, is that I see mouth-breathing adults who are absolutely convinced there's nothing wrong with their nose. Um, and as soon as I look inside their nose, it's, it's, it's nearly completely obstructed. They've, they've developed a sensory amnesia to having a problem. Yeah. And I'm seeing this in kids as well. They, they think their nose is fine. You look inside there and I show the parents and just go, this yeah. is blocked. But the, 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 David, this is what, one of my um, observations of medicine in general mm. is how that we're all looking at single point um, recordings. So most, you know, when you talk about, you, you look at some research on people's blood pressure. Well, that yeah. blood pressure will usually, particularly in the past, would have been a blood pressure taken by a nurse wearing a white coat in yep. a hospital at Correct. a particular event. Where, right. And is that representative of how people would be normally? Um, yeah. Probably not. But, you know, we're now yeah. getting these fantastic little devices people wear on their wrists. They're taking Correct. medical data all the time. And I think we're on the edge of an utter revolution in medical understanding because we'll suddenly be able to get yeah. in data all day long. Um, you know, yeah. I, I saw well, this we, thing. We've, we've already seen that in, in the adult sleep apnea world because we do these things called sleep studies, which is a one yeah. night point study. Um, there, there are certain type of pacemakers that have um, the ability to record um, elements of the breathing as well. So there's amazing technology. Oh, wow. and, and what they've done is they, they can take this data for you know, six months of data um, and, you know, they, they, they've got all these algorithms and, you know, the, 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 the clever people that, that, that just run these supercomputers that, 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 you know, work out all these algorithms. Yeah. And what they show is that there's a, probably a 40% variability over the course of six months as to what one night of sleep could be in terms of a bad night versus a good night. Yeah. So, so that's a 40% difference. Yeah. So taking so your snapshot at one moment in time is, 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 you know, you don't see the whole movie. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that may explain this difference you're seeing with the noses, um, the adenoid um, obstruction, Absolutely. because you might not see that on the day, but, you know, because they'll, they'll tend to be well when they come in. You know, people yeah. don't and, go and, to and, hospital if they're not yeah. well. well and, yeah, and the other thing is we get particularly caught out with nasal obstruction because there, there is a, a couple of types of nasal obstruction that are only apparent when you've been lying down for a while. So when people come and see me during the middle of the day, they've been upright, their noses look perfect. Yeah, I, I know sometimes that stuffiness, we, you're fine when you're sitting up, you go to bed at night and all of a sudden you feel a bit Correct. stuffy in your nose. Correct, yeah. And there's a couple of different reasons why that comes about. And, but that's where you get caught out because basically that's where our history is really important because if you just rely on the physical findings at the time, go, oh, the, this nose looks fine. You've got to go, hang on a sec, all right, tell me a little bit more about your nose when you're lying down. What do you notice? And you go, oh, look, as soon as I lie down, um, you know, it starts to block up. It starts to block up on one side, and then I have to roll over to the other side. And then, you know, then I've got to roll back to the other side again, and it's just like, you know, they describe it as fluid shifting back and forth. Um, it, you know, it, and it's not a gravity thing. What, what there is is on the side walls of the, the thorax, um, there's little uh, sensors that actually then, for some reason, that, that we don't understand why, actually interplays with nasal congestion. And this was identified back in the 50s and 60s, so 1950s, 1960s, just so we know which decade we're talking. So did you say size um, of the thorax? The, yeah, the, the side. On the side wall of the chest and also under the armpit, there are sensors that when their pressure is applied will um, have an impact with respect to um, nasal congestion. And if you want to go and look this up, the, the research was done in the 1950s and the 1960s. And it was basically in people using crutches. So if you'd broken your leg or had an injury and you were on crutches, when you were using crutches, your nose would block. So, that, so it's called the crutch reflex. Now, you ask, you, ask, <laughs> you ask 100 doctors if they've ever heard of this and they'll, they'll have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. But when we, when we lie down on our side wall, you know, like the side of our chest, whatever side we're lying on, that causes congestion on that side, so we roll over the other side. So that's one variable. The other variable is when we're upright, we, we, we're basically just bags of fluid, okay? And that fluid is, is quite mobile in some regards. So when we're upright, just by virtue of the gravity, that fluid will tend down towards the lower part of our lips. When we lie down, that fluid can redistribute, just like, you know, if you have uh, water in a glass, you know, if you hold the glass upright, it's there, you turn it there, it's on the side of the glass. So that fluid shift, can go up and actually cause some congestion as well. And then you can have certain nasal allergies or sensitivities to colder weather that cause nasal congestion as well. So, so you've got to be very careful about making a daytime assessment of the nose because of those nighttime variables that you would not otherwise appreciate. Yeah, no, no, it makes absolute sense. I mean, it's fascinating because, you know, we, we seem to be very dismissive of old research and yet, Sometimes I'm I, overly I, dismissive. My, 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 uh, pardon the pun, uh, Mike, but my jaw drops when I read some of this stuff from 100 years ago. Mm. When I, they I, don't I add it on the nail. I just go, I, I just, I, you know, it, it's, it's, you know it, we live in the world where it's freely accessible. You know, it's not hard to find it if you're sort of yeah. somewhat you know, knowledgeable in, in the search terms to look for and, and so forth. You know, and it doesn't cost anything. Um, it's just mind-boggling. You know, this, the stuff that these guys were observing and writing about it's just like, how on earth or why on earth did we ever forget about this? Mm. And then one, one thing that I think would be interesting to look from, from your point of view, because you, you have access to this um, data more than I would, but just as an observation, again, as an ENT, if we go 100 years ago, okay, to ENT practices, and ENT was really just a, a developing specialty with it in, in that era. You know, it was sort of a mismatch of a couple of different things, you know, as it was evolving as its own specialty. About 100 years ago, the number one reason, when you go and pull out all the old books, the number one reason that tonsils and adenoids were removed was for snoring. Okay? Now, there was also an element of history where that particular procedure was significantly overdone, substantially overdone. Um, it was just done for the sake of it. Uh, but, and then that was followed by a period of history, again, just after the advent of penicillin, um, where basically the idea of doing a tonsillectomy fell off the bandwagon um, and next to none were done. And when you make an observation in more contemporary times, 
uh, in terms of the change of obstructive sleep apnea. And you look also at the changes in malocclusion in more contemporary times. I suspect that certainly from the obstructive sleep apnea, I suspect from the malocclusion, even though there was a significant overtreatment with regards to adenoid and tonsil surgery, there was possibly an accidental and inadvertent benefit to a huge group of the population with respect to the fact that they were protected against sleep apnea and potentially some forms of malocclusion as well. And then the malocclusion started to escalate again, um, you know, as the tonsillectomies were, were stopped. And 20 to 30 years after that, we started to see the obstructive sleep apnea in adults. You know, when I went to university, uh, obstructive sleep apnea was a new and novel thing. And it was yeah, all put yeah. down to diet and overweight and obesity, and no one really paid well, attention. I've, I've got a slide on sleep apnea. I've got, I've got a slide Brilliant. coming up. Sorry to preempt you there. No, no, at least, no audience, right. at least the audience knows I haven't seen your slides because you know you yeah, yeah. think this is a setup, but you know, this is great. So anyway, so we've termed this general change in facial structure as craniofacial dystrophy, and dis meaning bad or wrong, trophy meaning development come growth. Yep. And, you know, the basic thing is that, that something that, um, oh, well, I'll, I'll come to that. That's the next slide. So now what, what I think is interesting is, you know, when you look at um, physics and astrophysics and a lot of these scientists, you really have this thing with the, you have the theorists and you have the observational, uh, the experimenters, you have the theorists and the yeah. experimenters. And, yeah. and it's amazing how effective this has been over the years. Um, but we don't seem to have any theorists in medicine. Uh, you know, look, I, I wouldn't be so despondent. I, no, I think we've no, got, there are. We've, 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 got, we've got a good number. Um, but the, the problem with medicine, I, I, I suspect it's the same in dentistry and all its forms. The, the problem in medicine is when the, you come across and, and propose something that is completely contrary to the status quo, mm the initial response is to uh, consider it laughable. And I can give yeah. you the perfect example in my lifetime is stomach ulcers. Yes. So stomach, stomach ulcers were considered to be a disease of the vagus nerve and the surgery for it was what's called a vagotomy. So it's a surgical disease and what you did is you went in there and you cut the vagus nerve, which uh, depletes um, the stimulation for the production of stomach acid and you know, it was basically an overactive vagus nerve that was causing it. Um, ironically, as Australians suggested, no, yep. it's actually an infection that is causing stomach ulcers. They were laughed at. Fast forward to now, it is the leading understood cause of stomach ulcers. Yeah. And yeah. If, if they, if they, you know, and, and to, to, you know, for someone to have even bothered thinking about this, and then, then, you know, then explore it and investigate it and study it and then suggest that, you know, everybody was wrong, um, you know, is, is just laughable. But yeah. here we are. And, and medicine is littered with, with these experiences of anything that, you know, is established um, is, is, you know, could never be wrong. Yeah. And I think there's a, fabulous, there's a fabulous quote that comes from a, a lecturer at the Mayo, um, I think it was the Mayo Clinic, uh, the professor. And he said to his students, allegedly, 20% of what I'm teaching you now is wrong. The problem is I don't know which 20% it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember... So reading, I think, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it becomes up in the next sentence I'm here. So it, it, in medicine, okay. you know, if an idea contradicts current thinking or if you're the wrong person. So we, what this, we, we do have a tendency of having this hierarchy. If someone doesn't have a PhD or they don't have the specialization. Yep. I sometimes think you, we, people can get a bit blinkered. Yeah, I agree. And, and of course, we've got this concept where everyone's saying prove it. And we seem to have forgotten that it's supposed to be about disproving something because often it is very difficult to prove anything. Yeah. And of course, my last point on the slide is We've got very little information on how function in the face is affecting growth because yep. it's hard to measure function. Yep. Your posture is even harder to measure because it's basically function over time. It's how you function right. you know, for an hour right. here or function for an hour here. Exactly. There's almost no evidence on posture. So no one can prove me wrong on any of this. Yeah. Because there's just no evidence. You mean a yeah. lack of evidence? Yeah, I agree. Um, 
So I, I go on now to say that, that basically, if something's not the right shape, so a face that is not the right correctly, and that's simple. And of course, we can't forget that the face is connected to a body as well. And that's yeah. mainly as we're talking about forward head posture and these other things. Yeah. Now well, it's that I'm whole more... form and function, function and form again, isn't yeah. it? It's, yeah. It's, yeah. And of course, you know, as a face lengthens, as it downswings, it's going to become narrower. Correct. And the space above the roof of the mouth, so the roof of the yep. mouth here, right? Yep. Yep. Is a nose. Here it is. There's the yep. nose, yep. the space there, it's there. And of course, yep. here's the same illustration, but in a, um, so this is a cone, this is a three dimensional x-ray, someone's taken and they've sliced it about here. So it's like you slice someone's head about here. Yep. And you're looking in to see what you can see. And I, I, I you know, there, there must be such a large crossover between a narrow palate mm -hmm. and these problems. Well, I, I have a good uh, physical, I, uh, I demonstrate this to parents just because, you know, you need to have something simple. So if this is the top jaw, all right, so there's your top jaw and the nose lives upstairs, okay? There's a very simple thing to demonstrate, all right? There's your palate. Here's what happens to the nasal space when you have a narrow yeah. palate. Or, and then you can lift it up as well, okay? Yeah. And as soon uh, as you show that, you know, it, 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 it's, it's basically... Down. Uh, it, well, it can come up with its elevator, but it doesn't even have to do that. Just by virtue of the fact that it's compressed inwards, I had about a, anything else. Um, I had a, you know, it's a very simple demonstration very for parents simple. to understand it. It's interesting. When ENTs, I had a long discussion with an ENT at dinner once, and I think that rather than this space physically going up, it's going up in relative terms. Yeah. But it's actually going down. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Anyway, and then the, um, one of the other things of, of, that seems to be sort of acknowledged within the orthotropic groups hmm. is the fact that if your face has dropped back, yep. if the tissue behind the upper jaw, this area here, so here's your upper jaw, yep. if the tissue behind here in what's referred to as the nasopharynx is yep. looser, also, you probably can't do a proper swallow because you can't get your tooth on the tongue onto the roof of the mouth. Then as yeah. you try to swallow, it's, you're going to have to use different muscles. You'll have to do a different type of swallow. The okay. tissue in the nasopharynx is less tight. And okay. you end up not opening the eustachian tube when you swallow. Okay. Look, well, I won't, less I won't, often. I won't. Yeah, I, I, look, I might share a different perspective because yeah, yeah. The, the, the tissue around there is, is actually very tightly held together by what's called the pharyngobasilar fascia. Okay. So that's, that's a very This is your area, taut, clearly. Yeah, yeah, this is a very tense, taut bit of tissue. So, so what possibly, if I might make an alternate suggestion, may be relevant is that the, the muscle pull, um, if when we swallow, is the palate pulling on the eustachian tube. Eustachian tube has bone and it has cartilage. And it's the opening up the cartilaginous part that then that leads to the function. And we have to think about muscle, you know, we talk about muscle tone, but the individual muscle fibers have the same strength as, as any other muscle fiber. It's not like we have weak muscle fibers. We have an issue with it, basically the muscle function. And one of the things about the muscle function is the vector of pull. And when you have your eustachian tubes uh, outwards, okay, and then you have your palate muscles under tension, when they pull, that tension's already there, so you actually get an effective um, swallow, as, as you're alluding to. When everything is squashed in, then those muscle fibres basically are not under a prim you know, an initial state of tension. So in a way, they are, you know, as you've sort of said, said you know, in, in generic terms, looser. So the actual muscle uh, pull on them is not as good and we've explored this and, 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 and found that we're probably on the right track because we can do these experiments where we can induce middle ear problems by putting Botox into the soft palate. So we can use botulinum toxin to paralyze the palate, weaken the palate and so it can still move but maybe not as well. That in, in turn affects the eustachian tube function and it leads to middle ear problems as a result. 
And I think it explains why palatal expansion potentially helps eustachian yeah. tube function yeah. is because as you take the palate out, you're also then reintroducing tension and changing the vector of pull of those palatal muscles. Yeah, I'm guessing people were Botoxing the palate to stop snoring. No, no, this was in an animal experiment, sorry, just to clarify. Oh, right, okay. But, okay. So, so try, <laughs> trying to basically look at pal palatal function uh, in terms of its effect on eustachian tube function and then the development of middle ear problems. Yeah. Now, Dave, one thing I haven't gone into, I haven't covered in this, because I really cut everything down, is <clears throat> this um, swallow, this swap from an infantile suckle to an adult swallow. So when you're born, yep. your tongue goes between your teeth. Yep. And you yep. use yep. these, the, the cheek muscles to um, suckle. Yep. And then yep. at about somewhere between one or maybe a little bit earlier and somewhere between three years old, probably, you've got to swap from a suckle to an adult swallow. And right. I think this is inhib being inhibited by tongue ties, by lack Agreed. of breastfeeding. Agreed. Um, uh, in nasal intubation. Yep, I agree. Um, you got to be careful with the nasal intubation because the nasal intubation actually deviates the septum as well. Uh, well, but, yes, yeah. yeah. I've seen some some that I've definitely think. Or, or th then on the other hand, David, as the the virus downswings, we were discussing this briefly the other day, whether or not yeah. that causes the um, septum to buckle. Yeah, it's an interesting observation, and and, and I've I've heard that theory before. And, and I understand the premise of it, but one of the things is I, I, I haven't, con I'm still not convinced. And, you know, yeah, I'm, not, I'm, yeah, not, yeah. I'm not, not disputing yep. it, but I'm still not convinced. Um, and then the other thing I've heard is that, you know, deviated septums don't happen in other primates. But I, when I heard that, I thought, wow, that's really interesting. So I went and looked it up and it was actually not true. So, <laughs> so, so roughly speaking, about 10% of primates in, in one study that I found, and these are wild primates, these are not in zoos and all these sorts of things. I think it was primates in Malaysia from memory or Thailand, I can't remember. Um, but they were in the wild, and 10% of them had a deviated septum. So I, I think, again, a deviated septum is a manifestation of all sorts of things that we really don't know because we weren't there at the time. There's sometimes there's an obvious history of, um, you know, some form of, um, you know, trauma that, that, you know, makes sense as to why it then is subsequently out of place. We can do um, fetal ultrasound scans, and some of the research shows that up to 15% of the septums are deviated in those studies. But then when we look at babies that are born, it's about 3%. So there's a, there's a, there's a bizarre thing going on that, again, no one's done the longitudinal research yeah, yeah. To, uh, to get a good cohort and just, just, you know, watch over time, you know, what is happening, what is evolving. We're, we're, again, we're looking at the end point and we're trying to explain the movie. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, and then we could talk about adenoids on tonsils. I think we've, we've covered oh, we those. We could. I'll bore you to tears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. The next one, of course, is um, sleep apnea and snoring. Yeah. Um, and so I, when I did some research a while ago, I found out that the one of the most statistically significant predictors for sleep apnea was yep. the distance from the insertion of genioglossus here. Yeah, front front yep. edge where the tongue's tied in here, so the yep. back of the so the posterior pharyngeal wall, so the back mm -hmm. of the throat. So yep. that distance there was one of the most statistically significant differences for sleep apnea. Yeah, and what's happening is faces are just dropping down as face are down swinging. This distance is reducing. Your tongue's Correct. effectively going down into your airway. Oh, yep. so I, I noticed this slide has been malplaced. It's slightly over that image, but never mind. That's right. Now, I think, you know, I think it, it's, it, it, I don't know, have you got anything to add here about sleep apnea? Well, I, again, I, I think we've made the mistake of calling it a disease um, without recognizing that it needs to be phenotyped because we have different contributing factors that come into play. So we know that we have skeletal deficiency. We can have soft tissue excess. We can have weight excess. We can have muscle tone problems. Mm. We can have 
uh, other things going on with regards to you know, structural deviations of the nose, for example. We can have neurological contributing factors, and those neurological factors can be uh, central factors in terms of how the brain functions for whatever reason. Uh, and we can also have peripheral chemoreceptor issues going on. And we are, again, not really following things longitudinally and, and so forth. So to try and pin obstructive sleep apnea down to one thing would be like to try and say that arthritis is due to one thing. There are multitudes of type of arthritis, and, and medicine has categorized them and classified them. We haven't done that very well, the obstructive sleep apnea. We basically yeah. just measure, we measure it on a sleep study and we say, this is what it is. And then, you know, again, the analogy that I use, that would be like doing a blood test and saying that you're anemic. So, Mike, if I did a blood test and found that you're anemic, there would be a big difference between you being anemic because that you, you at, at this moment in time, have an artery severed and you're pouring blood out at a massive rate of knots versus maybe you've just become a little bit iron deficient over the past 20 years. Yeah. But when we measure it on a blood test, the outcome would be the same. We'd say, oh, you're anemic. But clearly, there's two very different clinical scenarios in play. The problem no. with obstructive sleep apnea is we don't address those clinical scenarios in the same no. way. No. Now, what I'm going to hypothesize here, mm. talking to you, is that we've got to, we've got to, we've got to consider about ideal, so ancestral ideal, modern normal, and people with malocclusion. So yep. you've got ideal, modern mm -hmm. normal, people with malocclusion. Yep. Yep. So what I'm going to hypothesize that the, the facial shape is the cause of sleep apnea. The other factors you mention are contributing factors. Yep. So my hypothesis goes that if you've grown like an ancestral norm, yep. then it doesn't matter if you have those extra factors, it's not really going to affect you. If yep. you've grown like a modern norm, well, those factors yep. could impact you, particularly if you've got more than one. And yep. if you've become an orthodontic norm, whatever we're going yep. to call someone who's very yep. downswung, yep. then yep. those factors, any one of those factors is going to kick off and cause you serious problems. Yeah, abso absolutely. So and, just and, as and, a, a hypothesis to put up there. Yeah. Look, the, 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 my, my, when I talk about this, I use the analogy of a room. Okay. So if we have a room, okay, do you have a ballroom or do you have a broom closet? Because that's your bone structure. So that's the physical space available. All right. And if we try and jam a million people into the ballroom, it doesn't matter how big that ballroom is, it's going to be overcrowded. It's not going to work. But if we put three or four people in that ballroom, it, it, there's, 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 no, there's no issues at all. So, again, that's, that's what you're alluding to. Mm. And, but if you have a broom closet, it doesn't take many people to basically fill it, fill yeah, it up. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the, the, the ENTs can come along and sort out the contents of the rooms, but the orthodontists need to sort out the parameters of that room. Yeah. And when people look at you know, and this is one of those big things, this whole chicken and the egg argument as to, which one came first? Is it a breathing problem uh, that was because of jaw issues that led to, you know, tissue changes that then compromised what was already compromised? Or was it a, a tonsil and adenoid thing that led to a jaw problem and those sorts of things? And look, I think those discussions are interesting, but they're also an unknown reality. Um, and again, I don't know if it really matters when we are dealing with the endpoints that we find ourselves with. Because when yeah. we find ourselves with these people at these endpoints, at these um, ages where it's hard to change structure as well. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and when we look at um, you know management of, of children versus adults um, with with upper airway obstruction. Well, let's um, go on to management. Okay, fabulous. So I've put some of the the, the treatments that we're familiar with. Of course. Yeah. Um, you know, I presume you would have probably have others to add to the mix there. Oh, look, I mean, there, there, there's a multitude of treatments I, yes. and, and management I, algorithms for this. Um, but, but my clinical approach is to phenotype them. What do so, you mean by phenotyping them in this well, context? What I mean is, 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 is that if, if I, uh, there, there will be a history, okay? 
And the yeah. history, you know, has variations to the theme. You know, are they mouth breathers? Are they snorers? Do they have sleep apnea? You know, do they have hay fever, allergy, asthma, those sorts of things? But they're important. Are they overweight? And, and you, know, you know, those sorts of things, something you can observe. But that then creeps into the phenotype. Because from the phenotype is basically, I break things up into three, well, actually four levels, okay? Level one is what's going on through the nose, you know? And this is the anatomical aspect of things. You know, there, there's other, like I said, neurological things and so forth. Mm. But anatomically, level one is through the nose. Level yeah. two is through the mouth. And level three is through the, th the throat. Level four is their weight, okay? And they're the, okay. Uh, those, those four things I can clinically appraise. And then, and then when I do so, then I have some sense of, all right, what is it that we need to manage here? So if I have the history of a child that has you know, terrible snoring, terrible sleep, um, they stop breathing at night, and physically they've got big tonsils and big adenoids, that is part of the treatment paradigm. But if at the same time, as part of their phenotype, they are skeletally deficient, then those skeletal deficiencies also need to be addressed. And I think this is where people possibly misunderstand the intention of surgery and, 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 and can also malign surgery. The, the intention of surgery is not necessarily to effect a cure, um, but it is to generate a rapid uh, alleviation of airway obstruction. Yeah. And, and it's important that you sort of understand that there's a spectrum of things because there, there, there is no great benefit in a, an ENT surgeon taking out small tonsils and small adenoids. It, it, you know, it really doesn't achieve very much at all. Um, and if they're skeletal deficient, then, that, then they need the skeletal deficiencies you know, addressed. They, they don't need ENT surgery. But also, if um, they've got big tonsils and adenoids and skeletally deficient, they, they need a rapid relief of that obstruction. Uh, and then you can sort of build on it from there in terms of dealing with the skeletal issues. Mm. So I, I, I don't think we should be arguing, you know, about, you know, surgery versus orthodontics and those sorts of things. Um, no, because yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's, a, it, it's a both kind of a situation yeah. in, in, in certain children. So, so when I say phenotype, that's what I mean. When I look at them, I don't just look at their tonsils. I don't just look at their adenoids. I, I look at their septum. I look at their turbinates. I look at their tongue and I look at their skeletal jaw. You know, have they got a, a mandible that's not coming forth probably? Have they got a high arch palate? Because yeah. I have enough insight to know that I can empty out the broom closet, but that broom closet still needs to be turned into a ballroom. Yes. Yeah. And of course, I'm in the business of making ballrooms, so I tend to look yeah. at it from the ballroom perspective. Yeah, and look, and I think that's where, you know, this is a great opportunity where there can be a meeting of minds mm. because, and, 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 and that's, 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 that, 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 that's been the paradigm shift for me is working with so many dentists is yeah. because, you know, the, the, the ENT medical paradigm is that it's ton in kids, it's tonsils and adenoids, you take them out and you've got 100% cure for life, you know, and that's clearly not the case, clearly not, um, you know, and I'm, I'm very grateful to have been awoken to the fact that that is not the case. Yeah. Um, and and, and, I, and I, I like to find everything that's going wrong so that uh, I can fix the, 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 the my bits. And then and, and the feedback I get is it then has made the job of the, the, the dentist and the orthodontist a lot easier mm. because awesome. they're not having this tug of war against yeah. a breathing problem that they're trying to then develop the bones around. Yeah. Um, now... The top two images here, they are um, these advancement splints. How, what, what's your review on these splints? Yep. Yeah, so, um, again, if, if you look, you know, this, this is the sort of the, the, the awakening. I, I was, and I worked this one out myself. I'm, I'm, I'm going to pat myself on the back. Because I noticed in these adult sleep apnea X, you know, the reason that dentists were, were using these advancement splints in a good number of them was because they were skeletally deficient at the mandibular level. You know, it's exactly the same thing that Harvold and everyone was showing, you know, in terms of skeletal deficiencies in kids. You know, so, so you know, the, the, the bones that you end up with an adult is grounded in the bones that you had as a child. Um, yeah. So, if, you know, if you so go back in time. Um, I, 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 I have encountered individuals who have changed. Yeah, that's, absolutely. I so, see it myself. Yeah, you know, I, I, one, um, one particular girl I remember who came in with this unbelievable facial development yeah and she brought in 
images of her when she had her orthodontics years ago. Yeah. And she um, produced these slides because it was on old format. And I looked at these slides and I, I, I to be honest, I was thinking you, you've bought the image of the wrong person here. Yeah. Wow. You know, who, who's this? Because this isn't you. And this yeah. was a girl, her, 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 she was a classic class two, so her was down like yes. this. And now yeah. she had this incredible, and I said, I said to her, what happened? And mm. she was thinking, and she, she goes, oh, well, I got a chewing gum addiction. Yep. And she had that for 10 years. And that time, yep. her whole facial form had changed like unbelievable. And of course, yep. when, we, when we think it's genetic, how people's faces grow, and you imagine you go from X to Y. But when you realize there's a huge, if not overriding, environmental component, well, then you don't have to go from X to Y. You can make an arbitrary path. Exactly. And she wanted me to expand her teeth because she's got mm -hmm. this tiny little jaw. And I said, are you still been wearing your retainers at night? And she goes, oh. yeah. And I go, all you would have had to do is stop yep. wearing your retainers and the whole lot would have gone out. I was going to say. That's, that's all you had actually, to do. She was anchoring herself to her status She quo. was holding her dental arches in, in this tiny little dental arch with extractions. Yeah. And how yeah. she'd made, and as I'm, I, I, I should have taken copies of her slides because yeah, that yeah, would yeah, have yeah, made a fantastic example. But oh, absolutely. Oh, where we live. Yeah. Now, my concern about those top ones, so my concern about the plastic and the more expensive version. Yep are that Newton wasn't wrong. If you start pulling the mandible forwards, yep, you it will the pull the maxilla backwards. Yeah. And in yeah. time, um, these, well, well, you already see it. So long-term research shows these, got these people, the mandibles coming forwards in these people. And yep. I'm sure if you looked, you would see the maxilla going backwards. And in time, yep. you're going to make the underlying problem worse. Yeah, we, 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 we're caught between a rock and a hard place in this situation. Yeah. Because we have people with airway obstruction. And, and as people will harp on, the gold standard is CPAP. That's, that's the mask treatment. Well, when we, when we look at ideals versus reality, the, the use of CPAP on a consistent basis after a year is only about 35, 40, 45% of people. Mm. So, so it's an excellent treatment that a lot of people just don't bother with. Yeah, now so, I'm going to come so, to see Pat. Yep, so then we've got to look at, all right, what else is there? And then we have these advancement splints. And the advancement splints are far better tolerated and far better used. And when we look at health outcomes, because you've got to remember, you know, I know you're focused on jaw and teeth, but when we look at health yep. outcomes in terms of the effect of sleep ap obstructive sleep apnea and what the treatments mitigate against, CPAP actually doesn't, as, on a populational level, and maybe at an individual level, but on a population level, doesn't actually mitigate against me the complications of sleep apnea very well. And mm. mandibular advancement splints actually do, um, actually a lot better. And it's just by virtue of numbers because more people stick with them. It's not that it's a better treatment. It's that it's a more accepted and utilised treatment at a population level. Now, either way you slice, slice this up, you're trading something off. You know, the, we have medications, they have side effects. Okay, so, so, you know, this is a treatment, there's a CPAP that has side effects. And what we need to sort of weigh up in a, in a global picture, because you can get very tunnel visioned on this, and, a, you, know, is, is that, you know, it's sort of abhorrent to tell an orthodontist that these things are going to change the teeth and the jaws because that's just sacrilege. Uh, but it might be saving the person's life. Yeah. And, and that's, that's, that's where you've got to find that balance in the conversation in terms of everything. Now, now one thing that I'm vehemently against um, is the use of CPAP in children when, when the alternatives is, is ENT surgery that, that would actually negate the need for CPAP. So, um, you know, What's I think... What's your you know, concern the, the, about sleep apnea in children? Uh, well, 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 the use of CPAP in children is basically it constricts facial growth. We, we've known yeah. that for decades yeah, you know, you know, you know. I knew that twenty years ago. You know, yes. Um, well, it's, it's, I, it's, 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 it just doesn't remember, make sense. I remember twenty years ago, a girl on CPAP who was also having orthodontics came into my department yeah. where I was training in in Denmark and in, in Aarhus, and this yeah. CPAP had literally bananaed her face. Yeah, 
Yeah. Absolutely yeah. banana of the place. Now, yeah. my concern is that I think that is likely to and is actually occurring in adults wearing CPAP. And um, yeah, I, 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 look, I, don't, I, I, I would be delighted to see someone do some research on yeah. it because um, I, th I think, at, you know, at, at a theoretical level, okay, so we can be, at, we can be the theorists again, Mike, um, it makes perfectly sense that it would be. Yeah. Yeah. You know? I, I think it just takes time. <laughs> Do, uh, David, yeah. one question. If you go on CPAP, are you coming off? No. It's not, it, it, it's not, a, it's not a cure. No, it, but then it, 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 it's a bandaid. It's it's you yeah. know if you if you if you have a broken arm, that's the pain relief that you're taking to make it feel better. Yeah, um, but the, but the broken arm is still there. The same with CPAPs. You know, it only works while you use it, um, and it, it, you're not you're not addressing the underlying issues uh, no. to it all. Now, no, I don't want to disparage CPAP. You know, CPAP for some people it is their only option. Yeah, you know, right. and if you've got a choice between again having some jaw issues versus having a stroke or a heart attack. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a risk benefit analysis that you've got to weigh up and be realistic about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I, I think it, it, it's a stimulus to find better ways. You know, mm. what have we got and how can we do this better? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Now the last slide here is of course, um, surgery. And I highlight that one because, of course, so what surgery is doing, it's getting an upswing in facial form. Yep. You know, so you're, you're, someone's here and you're moving it up here. And, of course, from yep. my perspective, I'm looking from a structural perspective. Yeah. What do you yep. think about this surgery? About, well, if we talk about, you know, specifically, obviously, this surgery is an adult surgery. We're talking about mandibular and maxillary advancement. Mm. If, if we look at the outcomes in terms of the, the, the improvement in airway, of, of, apart from an ENT surgeon doing a tracheostomy, okay, to bypass the whole upper airway obstruction, mandibular and maxillary advancement surgery is the most successful and powerful type of surgery to relieve airway obstruction. Yeah. What I think is a travesty is adults are ending up in the situation where they need that in the first place. <laughs> Fine. Yeah, exactly. And, of course, this is not something to be done lightheartedly oh look this I, is I, major I, I, surgery I, I, I don't get many people volunteering for this option no. when they're not when they're put in front of them yeah but yeah. it is but you know when you look at the scientific outcomes the, the, it is probably you know the most successful the most powerful operation that we have you've just got to wear the morbidity that, that's involved in going through it all and that yeah. and that's where the that's that's where people struggle to make that decision to go through with it and, and rightly so Oh, no, yeah, yeah, took very right. Mm. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So now I, I, I'm going to go back for a second, because, which I'll, I can say here. Um, so um, I, I, the comment you made, I can concur with. When I trained, so I finished my dental training in '93, mm -hmm. and the, I heard the word sleep apnea once, and that yep. was nocturnal presmal um, sleep apnea. And this was yep. people who had right side heart failure. So that's yes. the, the heart was not empty. Well, was no, I think, I think it was. Do you want me to anyway, explain that medically? You, you could explain that medically for me better right. than I can remember. All right. All right. So, so what happens basically is that when you have a breathing problem, um, that impacts, it impairs um, the, the, uh, basically the blood flow through the lungs. And one of the consequences of that in a roundabout way is when you start to lose oxygen in the lungs, the blood vessels within the lungs start to constrict, okay? When the blood vessels start to constrict, those, that blood pressure goes up. Now, it's the right side of the heart that pumps blood into the lungs. So if the right side of the heart is pumping against an increased resistance, then the right side of the heart has a tipping point where it starts to fail. Um, you know, and then the heart's a remarkable muscle. You know, it, it, it's, the, it's the one muscle that keeps going on and on and on. If you, those people that go to the gym and, you know, they lift their weights, you get to a certain point where you just can't lift that same weight anymore. It just, you know, it hasn't become heavier, but it's become, you know, to the point of your fatigue. It's the same with the heart. When the heart is pumping against the resistance, it has a certain amount of, 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 of take before it hits a tipping point where it starts to fail. 
So that's what the, the, the right heart failure. For, for those that are the, the Latin and medically minded, um, it, it's called core pulmonale. It means right heart failure due to blood pressure elevation within the blood vessels of the lung. And so anyway, thank you very much. And I remember we were, we were explained how these people would be propped up in bed. They because are. Because the higher you raise their um, chest up, the more it would tend to drain. And I remember that element in my dental training. Apart from that, we never heard the word. It was not in the syllabus. It was not related to any patient. Never heard it. And that I finished in 93. Now, in that space of time till now, there has been this, wow, increase in sleep apnea. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We, has we it just been... it, 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 it's 25 to 40% of the, the world population. Mm. Well, as I said, so in this slide I say here, I went to give a lecture in... Philadelphia a couple of years ago and I said yep. that I thought 10% of people over 60 will die a decade earlier from sleep apnea and its consequences. Yeah. And when I was asking people after, a, after the lecture whether I thought that this was an overall underestimation, every single one of them went, Mike, you're being a little conservative here. I was going to say, I think you underplayed it. I underplayed that. Yeah. Now, so my problem is, all right, ah, you know, go back there. My problem is that this group of people here, all right, yep. they were Spandau Ballet, if you remember that group. I do. Now, the thing is that they are now 60. Yep. Now, I guess they're a pop band that have liked to be better facial form and probably like more likely to be slim than your other average person. Yeah. Yep. So that they're biased. It's a biased group I've taken here. Of course. Yeah. However, I do this as an illustration. So if you look, just pick up your, go on to Google, go into 1980s, start Googling beach, start Googling um, image and put it on the image section. Mm -hmm. People were a lot thinner back then. People, uh, I, 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 yeah, I agree. And people, I think also people tended to have better facial form. Yep. I agree. Now, if that group there are getting over, significantly over 10%, uh, going to die young uh, from sleep apnea, mm -hmm. a decade, what's yep. going to happen to the population growing up now? Uh, I, I think we, we already know, I think that the statistics are in that if you look at life expectancy, this is the first generation that has a lower life expectancy than previous generations Yeah, for the first time in history. And we, we're going to plot that as an increase, increasing over the next couple of decades. I have absolutely no doubt that we have sown the seeds of some demise. Absolutely already. Yeah. Yeah. No, that really worries me because, you know, what are we going to do about it now? Yeah. I call this the inconvenient truth because and it doesn't happen all the time and I'm not here to point fingers and I want blame. I'm just saying that this is something that we need to talk about. And what we need to talk about is that sometimes orthodontic therapy can be retractive. Yep. And it pulls faces back. And there's certain yep. types of treatment are worse than the other treatment. However, yep. it's just not well understood. And it, yeah, I mean, in, you know, when you consider the other implications, yep, for as breathing and many yep. others, forward head posture, yep. jaw joint problems, that's controversial. From this, well, I, we need a debate, we need a conversation, we need to bring this I, out. I think, into... I, 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 I think one of the problems we have, and, and, and you, you may have better insight to this than I do. So, when I had my orthodontics done, so I, I was, I was the you know extraction, braces, um, and, and so forth. Once my treatment was done, that was it. Um, so so the, the, my, 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 and this is not a criticism, it's just an observation, is that those that are treating people orthodontically generally don't see people beyond the age of, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18. You know, they don't see them 10 years later, 20 years later, 30 years later. The, the, no one has plotted out the where were you then where did you end up down the track 
And I, and I think if we start to get these longitudinal, um, you know, research done, you know, initially we'd have to do it retrospectively, which is, has got all the, bit, the, the flaws of retrospective um, analysis. But if we can start to do some prospective analysis and, and look at the different types of orthodontic treatments that were done, extraction versus non-extraction, retraction versus non, you know, retraction, you know, all those variables, and, and look at a bigger outcome with respect to how did these people end up in their 30s and their 40s and 50s, which, mm. is not what, which is not what orthodontists do, you know, and it's yeah. not a criticism. It's, you know, there would be no reason for them to think that they would have to do it. But, it, you know, is there, per chance, a unrecognised lifelong health consequence of certain treatments done at an earlier age that we've missed? And yeah. if we've missed it, we better, we better find out sooner rather than later. Yeah. And I think that, you know, because the airway issue and the airway, yeah. knowledge of airway issues has become quite big. It's, it's still a little bit fringe in the world well, of orthodontics, but it's well, well, becoming I, I, a bigger I, I, subject. I, 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 yeah, I, I, I think that there's been an increased awareness of the fact that airway is kind of important, which is kind of ironic, mm. um, you know, and that sleep is, is a significantly underappreciated element of health. Yeah. So, so, so you know, we, we are turning that ship around, but we, we really, you know, we, we, <laughs> yeah. it, it's, not just that, it's not just at a healthcare level that we need to do it. You know, we need to change at the population level, but it's not going to change the population level until healthcare people actually realise just the relevance of this. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and we need a huge, massive paradigm shift and re-education of, 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 of awareness so that we have a collaborative, uh, you know, movement of being we'll proactive. <laughs> Yeah, we also need and get them into treatment. We also need inclusive debate because I mean, I was was was, I was slightly disheartened because the, the American Orthodontic Association decided to organise a conference on this issue, and they had a Marco Island conference, and it was a pack out, it was packed out, and yet they never asked the very people I feel they should have asked to be involved with it. In fact, it was almost as if the very people they should have asked were excluded. And um, I think that it I, was I, reflected I, I, in the conclusions. Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, pe people have a preconceived idea of what people's, you know, thoughts and agendas are. And I, you know, I'm probably one of those examples where, you know, people, you know, you know th have surmised, you know, certain things, you know, as to what I sort of think, say and do. But, but they've never actually sat down to understand what I think, say or do or understand, yeah. you know, the perspectives or the paradigms yeah. to it all. And yeah. I, I, think, I think one of the possible sticking points in orthodontics is, is this whole argument and debate of, of whether airway problems cause orthodontic problems. Um, you know, and it'd be a you know, really, you know, big shake up if, you know, someone, you know, was to say that that's the case. But, hmm. you know, my, my point, and you've already, you've already recognised this yourself because you've walked into an EMT clinic and been there, you know, for two weeks. From my point of view, if a child cannot breathe properly, the cardiovascular effects, the effects on the brain, are, 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 you know, they're, they're beyond dispute. You know, the, the, the science is beyond dispute. So, if, you know, the question is, does an airway problem cause an orthodontic problem? My, my honest answer, if you want to sort of avoid all debate, is, is basically say, who cares? Who really cares? Because that heart is a problem, that brain is a problem, and if by some, you know, you know, circumstance by fixing the airway, it also has a beneficial impact with regards to then, you know, jaw teeth development, orthodontics. Well, hey, look, throw that on the bonus pile if you want to diffuse these arguments. But because there's this sticking point that airway problems don't cause orthodontic problems, therefore airway problem is not a problem, that, that's, that's where it falls down yeah. in the logic. You know, and that, yeah. that's my real concern is that, is, is that, you know, people, I think, are still trying to have the argument over does an airway problem cause an orthodontic problem? My point is, who cares? It causes brain damage. You know, yeah. why, are we arguing, why are we arguing over the relevance of an airway problem in the context of orthodontics when an airway problem causes brain damage? Yeah, I, I, we, we, we need to philosophize and work out what's going on there. 
I agree. I, look, I, I, I would love to, I want to get to the bottom of that element, but I just want to yeah. highlight from a healthcare point of view, brain damage versus arguing over straight or crooked teeth. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It, it's, it, yeah. It, 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 it's, it, it's, it, it's, it's not a good starting point for a discussion. No, no, um, no, you know, no, you need to bring it back to airway problem yeah. bad. Yes, but there's clearly a relationship. Let's find out what's going on. Mike, you, you, I, you know, I, I get so many referrals from dentists. Um, and, and, you know, and, you know, I had a dentist uh, a week ago, you know, saying that she, you know, and she's a general dentist. She, she got on board with the airway things, sends me the stuff, I fix it. And she says, you know, when these kids come back, their jaws are starting to grow better. Like they're expanding out, you know. Going back and, to Linda Aronson. Yep, yep. You know, and, and look, that won't happen in every kid, and I don't expect it, I don't promise it. But, hey, who's, why would anyone be upset if that was a side effect of, of, of treatment of an airway problem by an ENT? You yep. know, why would that be so upsetting to people yes. to think yeah. that, the, that, that the jaw growth and development would be better in some individuals just by chance, not by design. Forget about you know arguing over whether we should be doing this to help jaw and teeth. It's just a it's just a you know coincidental byproduct of helping a child breathe better, their jaw and teeth grow better. Yeah. Why does that upset people? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um. Okay. So the the next thing is what what we're trying to do about these things. Now here is an individual who um I am. Um, it was about, we had about three years of treatment and then his warmness appliance for, he's been, it's a decade roughly. So he wore the appliance for seven years at night only. We worked on him for about three years. Yep. Now, what we've done is we've, we've gained that, we've gained quite a shit. Now he's holding his head in a different position. Now, yeah. this is him standing there looking into a mirror so his eyes are focused mm -hmm. into a mirror. We've yep. taken the photographs from about three and a half meters away without yep. a flash using a zoom lens. We're trying to be as high level as we possibly can take yep. the records. Consistency, yep. Consistency. So now, because his head posture changed, you've got to ask yourself, well, yep. has his, um, what's actually gone on? So um, we're not, I mean, I don't like, Kefs, you know, these x-rays they you take yeah. from the side of the head that we, we showed an image yeah. earlier on. Yeah. Now, they, I think, that is a slight fallacy to imagine their stable structures there. And I'll explain why in a second. And also in the UK, you can't take these at the end of treatment to check what you've done because the, the, convict, no. the, the idea is, well, okay, how, how's that yeah. helping the patient? So, yeah. you know, it helps you, you think about, but it's not helping the patient. So you can't yeah. take them without a need. So what yeah. I've done is I've been trying, playing around with what I call a medical facial overlay. So if you mm -hmm. see how I have laid that out, so I've got the tragus yeah. of the ear. So here's the tragus of the ear, you know, there. Yep. And we've yeah, gone yeah. on yeah. soft tissue nasion. So these were more or less the spots you'd be using. Yep. And as you can see, the eye and the tragus and the ear stays the same. Yep. And it seems that we've got a really quite dramatic change in facial form. Yep. Yep. I've, now, I've got a suggestion for, for, for yep. what you're doing here. Yeah. What, I, what I would do, because, because um, we we're, in, we're in the process of analysing facial form in obstructive sleep apnea. Using and photographs or 3D? Uh, photographs, uh, but also okay. 3D scanning. So 3D scanning yeah. as well. And I think 3D scanning is probably the way of the future, realistically. Yeah. Well, we've been taking 3D scans of everyone. Not okay, as perfect. far back as him. Not as far back of as him. Of course. Yep. Because we're and, now and what, yeah. Yeah, what's been suggested is to take out any human bias, is forget about the normal anatomical landmarks that we use as reference points. Because when we use those, then we're arbitrarily assigning importance to those landmarks. What's been suggested is to have the, the, the data compiled and then give it to a, a, a computer and let it do the computations. Let it find out by itself, without any human bias, what are the changes, what are the differences that are relevant to the outcomes. 
Um, and that's actually probably, the, you know, again, just, you know, where we need to go to that next level because we can talk about, well, you know, this point and that point, but by doing that, we've introduced a human bias because we've assigned arbitrarily importance to, to that reference point. Mm. So that, that's just a, as an aside, but no. I, I'm finding this very interesting. Sorry, sorry no, to interrupt no. you, please. That's okay. I would love to investigate that more because that's, this is so important to understand what we're doing. Yeah. So now I arbitrarily, let me move this um, thingy out the way up here. So now the, I've just approximated an airway mm -hmm. on this yep. individual. Yep. But I would approximate the fact that there is a lot more space for his airway. And this is only in one dimension because it would have of happened course. laterally as well. Yeah. It would have happened sideways yeah. as well. Yeah, exactly. Now, I, so I would suspect that he now has space for all his teeth and mm -hmm. some pretty swollen adenoids and tonsils as well. Yep. 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 You've made the ballroom. Yeah, I've made the ballroom. And so, you yeah. know, I think as long as you don't have a, a million people, he's going to be happy. Yeah. And effectively, what I've done is I've gained an upswing in his facial form. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, yeah, the only thing is, where do I put that up there? Is that it's only, I'm only just getting that to cost effective now. Yep. Yeah. Because the problem is changing people is hard. And of course, I expect the teeth to straighten. I yeah, for lots of reasons. I expect the teeth to straighten themselves. And I yep. think, in theory, this should be possible for anyone, even at the end stages of growth, and slightly <laughs> after the end stage. That that's my mission and my project at the moment. Okay. But I don't think that I'm really going to get this very well, very good effects, until I get the spotlight of modern research to shine on this. Because me as an individual. Yeah. 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 You, you, like I said, I mean, what, what I was talking about, I mean, you need to engage a, a, a computer science department. Yeah. Yeah. It's got these computers and you, you know, you, you just, you just feed it the data and mm. then it'll take four or five days for the computers to, to churn over it. And, and, you know, the artificial intelligence algorithms that they have to actually then, you know, spit something back at you. Yeah. Um, but, I do, but also, yeah. you know, getting, you know, this is a huge subject. I would need departments yeah. and more departments in a number of different fields to focus yeah. on this, to, to make headway, really. Yeah, of course. Now, I, here's his upper jaw. Now, when I say I have cured him, mm -hmm. well, I struggle. I wonder if he's going to get space for his wisdom teeth in, because that's my objective. Yeah. Okay. Make someone yep. with space for their wisdom teeth as well. So I've definitely helped him out. He went nine months without any form of orthodontic appliance in his mouth. Just yep. let it go. And the teeth yep. were straighter at the end of that nine month than they were before we started. Yep. Now, next of a girl from down your way. Yep. So she actually comes up to see me from Tasmania. Mm -hmm. And we simply gave her, because I, I didn't want to do any expansion on someone that comes that far. Of course. But she claims that her sleep apnea has been completely cured. Well, look at her jaw structure. Well, yeah, and that's done non-surgically. Yeah. 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 So, and, you know, I think, so, we're, you I, know... I, I can only congratulate you. I mean, this, this, yeah, this is... No, I, 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 can, I can congratulate her, not me. She worked oh, well, very, you, very hard. You can be a plural in English, so I can say, say you, and then it goes to both of you. Cool, cool. Now, of course, what was also interesting, because when I started putting this information out online, mm -hmm. I, st I got this group of followers called these people who are doing mewing. Mm -hmm. Because when they understood the implications of what I was saying, mm -hmm. uh, it, it started this. So I got a lot of them contacting me, asking me what I would do in the X, Y, and Z situation. So I'm, it was quicker and easier to make videos explaining what I was doing. Of course. And of course, these videos have literally gone viral. Yeah. It, it's, it's just craziness. And as I you, said, you, about, you, you, you've become a verb. Yeah, I've become, become a verb. I mean, whatever. But it, what's amazing, I'll go down to this. I've been stopped, what, about 10 times in the last two years? About the last 18 months. 
where people yeah. literally on the street in stations, in supermarkets, in shops, and a lot just come up and say, look, thank you very much for all your work. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, but we're 18 months ago when, as I said, I, a reporter approached me and I tried to find some images to demonstrate the yeah. changes people were getting. Yeah. And we were really struggling. In fact, I found what was interesting. This guy here, who calls himself Astro Sky Online, he showed me an old photograph of where yep. he had been, and then this photograph here, this one on the left. Yep. yep. And you could see change. I could tell a change, but it wasn't clear and obvious. And the photograph was a bit dark because he'd, to find a lateral yep. photograph, he'd had to find a photograph from some in the background yeah. of someone else's photograph. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, and all sorts so of things. Yeah. this photograph was 18 months ago. Mm. And now, and he was using this photograph as the finished photograph. However, now from there to there, you, you, you know, there's, there's no questioning that he's gained huge facial change. Yep. And he's done that. I've never met him. Yep. Um, I mean, and also... Whereas when I asked for this photograph 18 months ago, he was a one of an exception. Now you can go online and you can find, oh, so many people. So many. Yeah. 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 All putting for images. He's probably one of the best. But I've seen a lot of sort of photographs in that ball range. Yeah. And of course, yeah. we then ask the question, the health or appearance question. And of course, I often think that health um, attractiveness is health. When someone says, you know, we're, you know, someone says to me, oh, Mike, you're looking healthy. What do they really mean? Mm. They mean you're looking good. You're looking good. Yeah. yeah. And in a way, it would make sense that we were hardwired to be attracted to people who were healthier. Yeah. yeah. So in a way, people keep knocking me. They go, oh, well, you're just getting pretty faces. We're making people healthy. Mm. You know? Well, I mean, health, health, I mean, obviously, you know, we, we know that there's a huge industry that's out there called the cosmetics industry. And that's, you know, within healthcare, but also, you know, beauty, makeup, the hair, hair, all these sorts of things. And, and, and it's basically that, that thing called self-esteem. You know, it's a psychological wellness. And if you feel good about yourself for whatever reason, um, that actually translates into health benefits. And, and, and one of the undeniable elements of it is, is how people appraise their looks. Um, it's not the be all and end all. And, and, you know, it's not saying, you know, everybody's walking around being, you know, movie star type material because that's, that, that's genetics and probably, you know, some very good plastic surgeons um, and, and so forth. But, you know, just that general, you know, you have that sense of well-being that comes with looking good makes you feel good. Mm. Interesting. I'm going to come back. I'm going to put my hypothesis. I'll put it up there that I should be able to get 90% of modern humans towards or pretty close to that movie star appearance. Uh, with, That's with, going to be with, mine. With, if, if, if they put the work in. No, you've got to get in at birth. Yeah. You've got to get in really right. early. To do that, to get yeah. 90%, you're going to really have to get in very early. I mean... Yeah. That, well, that you've got to get the breastfeeding going for starters. Yeah, you're going to get breastfeeding. You've got, almost going to get fit mums. It's selecting yeah. the right diet. If you want to get that level, yeah. you've yeah. got to go. You know, that's a holistic. You know, teachers telling kids to sit up straight. Yeah. Um, changing, you know, bringing back a lot more exercise to schools. That sort of thing. Huge, and that's where, you know. Huge need for that. You know, yeah, huge, huge need for that. that. Um, but um, there's a point I've never mind. If, never mind we'll go. So when we're talking about the health aspect you know we, we've shown that um you know the the um camacho research meta-analysis in stanford's showing this huge improvement in sleep apnea for um 50 in adults and over 60 yep. percent in children, 60 in children. Ex exercises that i think are far less effective than the exercises that this individual has been doing you yep. know far less yep. effective because yep. he's got real change from that. Whereas when I see people in myofunctional therapy, I see maybe a, you know, I don't see massive change. I see an improvement. Yeah. I don't see yeah. massive changes. That's in the teeth. When it comes yep. to face, I don't see improvements. Yep. Yep. So I think that, you know, and then when we go, oh, I, I may, was going to make a comment. We were talking about um, 
Ah, uh, confidence. I'm, I'm, I was watching uh, a video with Jordan Peterson. Now, I know he's mm -hmm. quite a controversial character, but he was doing his book review. He's written a book, 12 something, so 12 Rules to Life or something. Okay. And the first rule of life, he was talking about stand up straight and present your wealth. Yeah. And it was fascinating because he was even alluding to the fact that he thinks that he was suggesting that you, that even may be related to obesity. The sort of, as you drop down like this, you're more likely to gain the disposition where you're going to crave um, eating all the time. All right. Well, well this, is, this is where it gets interesting because it becomes a vicious circle. Um, yeah. I, and, and, and look, I, I, I've actually written a book about this because there's so many you vicious do. circles that go on. Um, but basically, when, when you have some form of airway obstruction, that, that in turn results in some form of low oxygen level. And that low oxygen level is a systemic, so throughout the body experience. And one of the consequences of that at the gut level is that it changes the gut bacteria towards more of what we're generically calling the bad bacteria. Okay, we sort of have this very generic summation of things of good versus bad, and it's, a, it's an oversimplification, but it's adequate for need. So, so when you have this, the the, the bad bacteria um, seem to have an effect on your food seeking behaviour, such that you develop, and it's, it's almost like you know a parasitic overtaking of your brain, because the basically the gut bacteria direct you down the supermarket aisle to get the high calorie, low nutritional food. And, and you eat it and basically you're feeding those bacteria more of what they want. So they then thrive, which then leads to more of a signal of get more. Mm. And, and, and we've got some very good evidence that shows that the changing of the gut bacteria does in fact influence um, weight independent of diet. Um, but then obviously with the changes, the, the, the diet changes make it even worse. So, so we have a, a, you know, a really good situation here where basically nature is, is, you know, is using what, doing what nature does. It finds a vessel. Um, we are a vessel. The bacteria are within us and it finds a way of taking over to their advantage. And one of the things they do is they, if there are enough of them, is it changes your food seeking behavior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the, the age-old questions, do fat people become apneic or do apneic people become fat? Um, and and it's, it's, it's both. You know, this is that whole thing is, you know, you're basically trying to argue about, again, you know, chicken egg. It's, yeah, it's and, and, and at times, does it really matter? Let's treat it. Um, it doesn't change. The, again, it doesn't change the outcome that you've got in front of you by the time you get to that stage. Yeah, no, no. I mean... Yeah, I mean, if it's just trying to find answers. So, you know, one of my objectives in what I'm trying to do is gain what we refer to as an upswing in facial form. That's, that's my objective right now, is to try and get this upswing to, um, well, I did, to, to, to become part of the team that can get the upswing. Now, so that, that was a presentation that I made up to sort of stimulate yeah. some conversation. Yeah, and that was we, really good. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we've gone on a while, so we'll probably break this up into elements. Of course. Um, now, I mean, I, for me, it would, I now start trying to put meat on the bone and trying to, so it, 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 talking about putting meat to the bone, first of mm. all, is in the argument I've just given, the argument of mm. craniofacial dystrophy, do you mm -hmm. see any standing glaring flaws to the argument no i think what, what, and I, I shared this paper recently um in the past day or two again this, 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 you know this, this is this whole vicious circle that we are stuck in people you know in in animal studies at least uh, when they induce hypoxia bone growth is deficient and it's pro disproportionately affects the jaws more than anywhere else mm. So all they do is, is you know, generate a low, low oxygen environment um, and it has an impact on bone growth and development disproportionately affecting the jaws.
Mm. So, so I, I, I think we are dealing with, you know, the perfect storm here uh, I think in, this terms is of, in terms of what happens. You know, well, when, we, when we're suggesting, yeah. as we said, that we're talking about a significant number of the population are yep. going to die a significant time early. And that we're not talking yep. about small, we're talking about, it's not the majority, but it's going to be, it's approaching majority standards. In some um, countries it is. It's, it's just, I'm, I'm flabbergasted that we don't get more public awareness of this. You know, we can yep. sit here and we can talk about, oh, well, we know this, we know this, we know this. It, it's a very, very small group of professionals who are, acknowledging these facts and it's and it's and it, that's 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 a, again a, a real indictment on on health care um you know he- health care predominantly is centered you know this is where it's actually it's very different to dentistry but people go to the dentist every six months for a dental checkup to make sure mm-hmm. everything is okay and if it's not to get things addressed mm-hmm. yeah people go to a medical doctor because they are sick mm. so mm-hmm. we are we are managing outcomes rather than mitigating circumstances to prevent that outcome in the first place. Yes. Well, that's why a lot of people turn it around and say it's not actually health care, it's illness care. Well, uh, you're absolutely right. It is illness care. Yeah. Yeah. I would never yeah. forget the statistic that when you put a hospital into an area, what mm-hmm. do you do? Do you, the average health of a uh, population, so if you take a city that doesn't have a hospital, mm. you then put a hospital into the city. Mm. What does it do to the average health of the city? Now, there could be a bias here because you're actually picking up those with illness that were going under the radar. But the average, and there's no, there's no, it's not a small effect. Yeah. It decreases the average population markedly. And right. what, it's, what you're really doing is you're making ill people live longer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And Man, so that's, that's a big, big debate in healthcare. Is, is, yeah, is that's that, a big debate in healthcare. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a saying, and I'll probably get it wrong, but basically, um, what is it? I, I want to die of a young age. Uh, at, 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 was it? I, I want to die young at an old age. Yes. Yes, exactly. So you basically, you know, you want to compress your wellness into, you know, yeah. as many yeah. years as yeah. you can and, and, and your illness into as, as, as few as possible. Yeah, okay, cool. Now, David, I'm next thinking, what are our next steps? Because um, for me, yes, I'm thinking that I need, as you, you rightly point out, um, I'm part of a team. There are other factors I don't know as well. I can gain improvements. So we're starting to routine. We've just um, taken some pulse oximeters. So yep. with these high resolution pulse oximeters, we're going to be put, we're using these across the board. We want to use them when yep. we start treatment in the midpoint yep. of the treatment at the end of the treatment. We've yep. got the 3d scanner. So we're scanning everyone's yep. face at the same intervals. And we are taking these, uh, the, the highest level photographs that we can at the highest level. Yes. And that's with the, well, that's with a 3D camera? We do, uh, the, well, we've got or a 3D scanner. I've got a 3D scanner. I've got a poor man's 3D scanner. So I've got what's called yeah. a David scanner because that's all I can afford. I'm trying to chase yeah. down. Hey. You can get 3D cameras. Oh, I, I know the market now. I'll tell you, I have, I've researched yeah. it. I want the 3D MD because... Yeah. It's the best high resolution. All of the other 3D cameras lose resolution really quite quickly. Yeah. Well, not maybe after 3D MD, the next step down is fairly major. And the David scanner I've got at the moment, it, the problem with the David scanner is you have to lie still. Mm. And it takes about 10 seconds to take an image and it takes a fairly narrow one and you have to move around and take another yeah, right. one. And, okay. yeah. and we have to take about six to get a face in and then yeah. stitch them all together. Yep. However, we've been doing that for about three years now. We still lack the software to compare them. And it's just this, oh. all of this stuff is massively expensive. Can I, can, I, can, can I help you? Uh, well, I'll come back to you, but then I think we'll have a non-recorded conversation for that. But I would love to okay. um, chat that. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
so anyway, I'll come back to you as I, I make observations and things. I, you know, and I, I, but we just want to start collecting lots of data on what we're doing. Hmm. Um, and in general, I think, you know, David, that literally fascinating conversation. Oh, I, you know, I, was, I, was, I, was, would, I was thrilled. Absolutely. Yeah, thrilled. it would much. be good. That's cool. And what we'll probably, probably break this up. And I would be good then, I, I would, you know, I, I would love to be more specific, take some elements of what we've discussed and see if we can really target and dig a little bit deeper on oh, these there's elements. Plenty more that we, there's oh, plenty more that we Yeah, we, we just... This was the lightest scratch the surface. And I'm, how long are we going? What, two, three hours now? Um, yeah, and, and, and this, this is the nature of it, is, is that I, this I, isn't I don't, it. you know, well, I, I, know it. This, I know this so much, I can just wrap it on for, for hours. Yeah, yeah I know. I, I, <laughs> yeah. Keep me shut up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I think if we can set something up, be a bit more specific, be a bit more target, I'll wrap this up, I'll put this out. I'd be very interested in viewers who read underneath what they say. That's what I was going to um, say. Let, let's see what the what, what what the commentary is, what the feedback is, and, and yeah. sort of just you know surmise what's there. And, and you know, people have the usual questions and queries, and, and so forth. And then yeah. you know that, well, that, 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 that can David, guide the, the can talking I, points. What I usually do underneath these videos is put some useful links on where to go. Now, I'm could we have um, a um, you've got a, some great um, Facebook pages where you okay, are just run the Facebook down. pages. Just run well, the Facebook page. Just for, well, where, where, where do you think would be a good idea to re direct people to? Um, well, I mean, my personal page is really just me putting up pictures at the moment, just with short, you know, statements, which are just I'm just pulling off of research papers left, right, and centre. Yeah. So, so there's not a lot sort of dig there. The the science on this, um, in terms of the general topic of sleep disordered breathing and so forth, would be the snore to death. Um, Facebook page, and then the the dental element would be that yeah you know that dental practitioner page. So that you know probably you know if you wanted to sort of cherry pick out of those three or all of those three, that would be probably the suggestion with respect to where people will will, will get to a chance to explore the topic um, without being too overwhelmed with it being too scientific, but yeah. likewise you know, satisfying that curiosity as well. Yeah, no, and that makes sense. That, 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 that'll cater to the whole spectrum of people, people that, don't, you know, just are happy with the sound bites versus people that want the detail. Yeah. David, you mentioned you'd written a book as well. Yeah. Yeah. So Whereas, that's Snore to Death. Oh, that, that, okay. That, that, the book called Snore yeah. to Death, of course. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, listen, we must organize another thing. I will take um, recommendations from the comments below on what yeah. we should yeah. do next. But either ways, listen, for the moment, thank David, thank you very much indeed. Real pleasure, Mike. Really, really right. appreciate it. Thank you. Cool. No worries. Take care. Will do. Bye.